So welcome everybody to the Recapture the Rapture launch party. I'm very proud uh, to be co-hosting this with Jamie Wheel and Flow Genome Project. My name's David Fuller of Rebel Wisdom. Uh, we just put out uh, a version of Recapture the Rapture on the channel a few days ago. And we're gonna play a few clips of that during the, the session just to kind of ground the discussion because the discussion is split into three different sections matching the sections of the book. So we have Choose Your Own Apocalypse, The Alchemist Cookbook, and Ethical Cults. So, Lucas, I think you have the first of those clips lined up. So we'll play the very first clip to kind of ground us in Choose Your Own Apocalypse. And then we will begin with all of the amazing guests that we've got already here, ready to go. We're seeing an increase in rapture ideologies. And, you know, most of us, when we hear that term, we, will, we would think of, you know, sandwich boards, you know, the end is nigh, you know, ringing the bell kind of thing, or, or, or wired up to suicide vests, you know, that sort of thing. So sort of fundamentalist, traditional, religious end times stories. And for sure, we are seeing plenty of those. You know, and ISIS has a whole story. So we're familiar with those ones. But once you see that there's actually a structure underneath it, which is the world as we know it, the secular, mundane, 3D world is fucked. There is no way out of this. But there's an inflection point coming in the near future, and we can kind of see it from here. Um, and our people come up roses on the other side of that inflection point. Therefore, let's go as fast as we can towards it. Let's get there as soon as possible. And never mind the collateral damage, because we are leaving this reality, this complexity, this problem set behind. As soon as you see that, then you're like, oh, wow, how, how similar this is to techno-utopian raptures. We're going to be able to upload our consciousness to computers. You see them everywhere. And once you see them, you can't unsee them. Everybody is peddling some version of, hey, psst, but if you're on the inside of this, we have a way out. And we don't actually have to solve this impossible multivariable problem, which is freaking us all out. We can all just skip it and get to an outcome where we bypass the human condition. So without further ado, Jamie. Thanks. Thanks. Congratulations thanks. on your new book. Boom. Yeah, man. That was, uh, it's quite a, quite a thing to get it, uh, to get it across the goal line for sure. And super grateful to, uh, everybody that's played a part in that. Everybody that's here as part of kind of the Omegans who, what we playfully dubbed as kind of, uh, early evangelists for this content, um, to Amanda Joy Ravenhill, uh, the executive director of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, to Dr. Dennis McKenna, Dr. Adam Ghazali, Leah Song, uh, co-founder of the RAD, I don't even know what you guys would call yourself, slow fusion folk jammers and subversives, uh, Rising Appalachia, uh, philosopher Jules Evans, and general all-round indigenous gadabout and scholar, uh, and funny ass stand up hair farmer, Tyson Yunker Porter. So <laughs> all of you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and welcome. So I don't know whether our, in this particular format of zoom, whether, um, whether our, our viewers get to like do emojis and things like that, but if you did have them give these folks some love, um, and then just a little bit of quick run of show. So as David said, please make sure you have your chat window open. And please make sure you've got access to the questions and please both write in your own questions, but then also vote and upvote the ones that we think are going to be the, that should bubble to the top and that would get a chance to actually explicitly answer live. So as David said, the intention is roughly an hour per third of the book, you know, go, going on the themes of it. So theme one for the choose your own apocalypse is sort of existential risk, future, futurism, uh, civilization design, identity politics, culture wars, just, just kind of a situational assessment of what we're wrestling with these days. And, and we have, you know, expert guests um, who are deeply, deeply wrestling with those questions and inquiries. So just um, then the next one will be the Alchemist Cookbook, which is fundamentally a little bit more of kind of this would be in the realm of sort of alchemical biohacking. How on earth do we use widely available tools, most of them in our neurophysiology and psychology to uh, you know, seek and experience authentic inspiration 
defrag our nervous systems and potentially integrate trauma and engage in pro-social bonding from pairs to entire communities to you know potentially civilizations. And then the final part, the ethical cult building is, okay, well, even if we could figure out the rat's nest we're in, and even if we could heal and mend and connect and be inspired, it's actually trickier than it looks. And how on earth would we reinvent a sort of, you know, a meaning 3.0 that doesn't succumb to cultic tendencies and dysfunctional group dynamics en route to doing the hard stuff we get to and got to. So that's the intention. Now we're just going to boom, blow it up right away because we have so many amazing guests and not everybody could necessarily laser beam in at exactly the precise time where they're going to, their expertise matches precisely the conversation as we structured it. So we're just going to be doing the jazz thing to kind of keep it tight, but loose. That's, that's the intention. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, right? So we're already going to be into improv, but I think everybody here um, is deliberately a great jazz musician. So if you guys as an audience are cool with that sort of, we're just going to kind of go with this and steer it loosely between those guardrails, um, then we can just jump in. And so um, with that, oh, and, and Greg Thomas, um, beautiful. And so I want to, want to welcome Greg as well, um, who has deep experience with the um, Lincoln uh, Center Jazz Project and the, and the jazz, is it the, lat, is it the Jazz Leadership Project? Perfect. Um, so basically taking literally what I was just saying as a metaphor seriously, which is how do we take improvisational music making as um, both metaphor and practice for coherent community and novelty? Is that, is that an okay proxy for now, Greg? That is more okay. That is, that is very precise yet nuanced. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I'm going to get out of the way now. So um, what I would love to do is basically, I mean, we've got a small enough group of panelists, but it's, it's rich as well. So um, who would like to, um, we can, we can start with responses, opening position statements. Let's just kind of, who, who would like to kind of jump in from our panelists and then let's just kind of pick this conversation up and, and weave it where it goes. Uh, do you want to start, Jamie? Do you want to like kick us off, like lay, lay out a kind of the, the opening standard, and we'll riff off that? Yeah, like, well, uh, well, you, you can lay out the because um, I haven't got your book yet, and I guess some of the audience haven't because so, it's just come out. So lay lay out to us the kind of the opening thing, and we can riff off that. Well, I mean, we can we can just sort of start with you know the the introduction um, and and the tee up to part one, which was hey. Um, it really does feel like extremes have kind of hijacked the mic of our shared conversation on both sides of the political spectrum and other places, that there's this massive moderate middle, you know, arguably 99% of humanity that kind of is rooting for this to work out and not be burned down um, or deconstructed. And at the same time, we are wrestling with a collapse in meaning. Like it's really hard to make sense of what's happening because our normal trusted guardrails of like organized religion and effectively, you know, polite society, but you know, academia, medicine, business, government, all of these forces are clearly um, under siege, right? So our, our, short, our shortcuts, our heuristics are collapsing at the same time that the rate of change and complexity is going exponential. So there's a ton of uncertainty, anxiety, grief. There's a desire to, can we run away from this? You know, and that's where you see the missile silos and the fucking off to Hawaii or New Zealand or, or, or Northern Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, in fact, the Wall Street Journal yesterday just posted that Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Northern Idaho, is the hottest, fastest growing real estate market in North America. So if that's not a sign of people looking to get, get the hell out of Dodge, you know, don't know what is. And- at the time where we would be, you would think, okay, this is Churchill, you know, this is time to rally, never ever give up, plant your victory garden, or it's FDR, and the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, and this is our time. It's not. We're either running away or we're at each other's throats. So how do how are you guys? Because you're each prof, you know, profound subject matter experts in your own fields of inquiry. How are how are you seeing that? 
Um, and, and then what do you see as potential key, you know, key cruxes or sort of, you know, challenges or key issues or, or dynamics? And what would you maybe offer as ways forward, things that you would advocate for or take a stand for? Does that, does that track okay, Jules? Does that kind of tee up the space? And Adam, awesome to see you. And by the way, Adam Ghazali is traveling cross country in a rad new RV. You inspired us. I got RV envy. So we got one um, with, his, with his wife and their darling little newborn. So thank you. Thank you to everybody for making the time and especially for finding Wi-Fi someplace beautiful. As Jimmy said, I'm now on the, the Blue Ridge Parkway for any of you in North Carolina. And somehow I got a signal up here with a four-month-old daughter <laughs> standing right by my side. And, you know, yeah. getting in nature with a child uh, of that age is a great way to realign your perspective with what's important in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and I've been doing that for, for several weeks now, I have several months in front of me. I just, I feel like that a lot, you know, for, for those of you that just picked up Jimmy's book or are in the process of it, I also do want to give a plug to a lot of these really cool videos um, where Jamie, using his eloquent and cool style, really breaks down some of the topics in the book. I listened to two of them today since I didn't have time to read, you know, in, out here in nature. So it was a great way to see some of uh, what Jamie's talking about. And they're really very well, uh, you know, well explained and a nice companion to the book, I would say. But when I was listening to the uh, Choose Your Own Apocalypse sec section, what I kept thinking about is, you know, we have all these systemic challenges that we just heard about the two examples of our medical system. But I see this as actually more fundamental than that. I look at this, I mean, everyone looks at this through their own lens. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. So what I see is that we have not really embraced the, the foundation, the building blocks of how our higher order thinking and decision making and sense making, uh, what, what it relies upon, which is how we control our attention, how we regulate our emotion how we feel empathy and compassion, how we exercise our imagination and creativity. And so I actually see that these crises that we're all seeing through our own, um, own windows, and I know everyone on, this talk, everyone on this call sees that through their own perspective, I just see it as very fundamental to the lack of attention and nurturing that we have given to our minds. Um, and as a meditation practitioner, I'm sure you appreciate that, from, from that perspective, but from being exposed to nature, to meditation, to even from our childhood education pathways, to build the fundamentals of cognitive control and the ability to think at a higher level, to deal with the complexity, the escalating mm -hmm. complexity in the world around us, I think is essential. So that's that's the one thing I wanted to share here is that I think that the, the base of the pyramid is broken. The foundation has not been built strongly enough to allow the incredibly complex societies around the world that's now completely connected to, to flourish. And we need to get back to the basics. So that's, that's the message I want to throw. In. Beautiful. Anyone else who'd like to jump in and please, I mean, just let's just feel free to popcorn style. And to some of the folks that are asking great questions already, as far as how do we fix this? How do we get out in the world? How do we address families or children or any other community? Um, in the spirit of jazz, in the spirit of miles, in the spirit of the, any, a number of musicians, right? Let's let us go down into the mud. Like this first third is actually assessing the state of things. So if we can hold the, the discomfort of being here, we're not gonna, we're not gonna rehash and thrash tired old concepts. Like we don't need to sort of just doom scroll this thing together, but, and on the other hand, let's let this be going down into the mud. Like as we get literally into the music in section two, as one of the key things we'll, we, we will, I promise we end with a triumphant recessional, but you know, for now, if we could just kind of be in the dis-ease, um, I think we'll, we, you know, we'll, we'll pull up more gold. I can share a story from yeah. uh, Buckminster Fuller. He said, around 1976 that we had crossed a threshold of having enough, having the technology to take care of everybody on earth at a higher standard of living than any have ever known, he said. And um, he said it would take about 50 years for us to catch up and for that systems change to happen. So essentially moving from a finite game or a zero sum game into a win for all game dynamic. Um, so here we are. 2026 well, would be 50 years. So, so, so wait, is that right? Like, is the we are right? That's the 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So he said 50 years, and he said like towards the end, it would be like really hard to see. Uh, it would feel like everything was falling apart. 
um, mm-hmm. when really like by design right on time, we actually have all of the, mm-hmm. all the tools that we need. We just need to repurpose them uh, for the mm-hmm. new paradigm of win for all mm-hmm. um, game dynamic. And so all of, all of our institutions, he said, you know, whether it's educational or healthcare, uh, will need to be dismantled uh, and kind of rebuilt on the new system, on the new uh, way of understanding. And I think the trick, I like to call it the awkward era, because it's like the bad news is getting worse, the good news is getting better. Like, which, what do you choose? What wolf do you feed? Um, but I think the trick to it is that we have technology to upcycle essentially. So like drones were created for, you know, a lot of like surveillance purposes. Now we're using them to plant trees, you know, we've granted personhood to corporations. Now we're granting personhood to watersheds. Um, So there's a lot of signs on the wall that say that we're kind of like in this phase change, Um, but it's crunchy for sure. It's really hard to know what to pay attention to. Um, But I like to think that, yeah, just by, by focusing on that kind of like upcycling, uh, feeling that we all actually are far more capable than we could possibly fathom. Mm. Um, and then we can actually rebuild uh, what we need to build in such short time. We are running out of time. The window of opportunity continues to close every day um, in terms of all sorts of different ecosystem and societal collapse uh, factors. But um, yeah, I like to think there's a metaphor that he uses that I love so much that I got it tattooed, which is like, we're like a chick hatching from our eggshell. And like chick, like doesn't even know what its feathers or wings are going to be used for, uh, but has been incubated in kind of this me, me, me zone of this, you know, fossil fuel egg yolk. Uh, but we're about to kind of, you know, hatch and potentially fly. Births, births are fragile. They can also lead to death, but um, let's, let's, let's fly or die moment. Let's fly. Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, and, and as far as that 50 year lag time between the mid seventies now, you know, Tragically, and to our potential collective undoing, Buckminster Fuller forgot to factor in Instagram and the Kardashians. You know, so that was an X factor. I don't know if we, if, if we saw that one coming. But while we're on Bucky for a moment, because this is, you know, he is absolutely um, here in spirit and in intention. And in fact, um, the very opening of the book basically says, okay, well, if we want to be vigilant about rapture ideologies and we want to kind of really take a committed stand, not for one percenter solutions, no matter how you slice your one percent, um, was this really well-known quote from Bucky, which many of you may have heard, where he said, hey, you know, can we create a future that works for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone? And as far as like a team human kind of stake in the ground, that feels as inspired and inclusive and precise and grounded and accessible as, you know, maybe anything I've come across. And so, Amanda, well, you know, to just build on this, how, what, what is your sense of Buckminster Fuller as a thinker, as a human, and as a futurist? Because he was uncannily on time ahead of time. How did, how did he do it? And then how would, you know, if you could share for folks that may, may be, you know, not as deeply familiar with his body of work, how did he do the thing he did? Because he has contributed an awful lot mm-hmm. to this dialogue we need right now. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar with his work, uh, he's a D, uh, Leonardo da Vinci type, kind of a Benjamin Franklin type, um, most known for the geodesic dome and the word synergy. Um yeah, I think the way that he did it was through this lens, which he called comprehensive anticipatory design science, which is a mouthful, but we call it design science for short, uh, which is essentially looking to nature and ecology as inspiration for designing a world that works for all and understanding this win for all game dynamic that it will be either all or none. Like they say in Buddhism, none will be truly happy until none are suffering. Um, and so I think having that that intention um, and then also using nature as design inspiration and acknowledging that we are nature, uh, that the technology of nature is far more advanced than any like humanly contrived nature, uh, he liked to say. And uh, that by tuning into it and looking at the principles behind it, uh, then we can design a world that works for all. And we actually have an upcoming course. I just put the uh, link in the chat, link it again on design science. We'd love to have people join us. It's kind of like a 
systems thinking meets futurism meets biomimicry meets design thinking. Um, and Tom Chi is our board chair and he'll be co-hosting. Mm -hmm. Who's a super genius former Google engineer, correct? Yeah. And, and, and Tom is responsible. I don't know where this project has gone. I was with, at a, an event with him three, four years ago where he was talking about the autonomous drone tree planting of like a trillion trees and things like that. So yeah, yeah. please do. Anybody that's interested in practical <laughs> grassroots, you know, design thinking for solutions, um, please do check that out. Um, Tyson, obviously, that when, as soon as we hear the word biomimicry and the looking to natural systems, um, Tyson is obviously, you know, uh, uh, I won't call you an indigenous elder because I'm sure you'll reject that term, but um, <laughs> nonetheless, an indigenous academic and storyteller and your book, Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. Um, it, just, just map it for us. How, how does that weave into and, and complement um, what Amanda's been talking about with Bucky Fuller's principles and, and what unique distinctions are there for you as well? Yeah, it's um, a, a lot of our elders, I was actually talking to two old parties the other day and they um, kind of really roundly reject biomimicry as mm. a thing, like um, see it as potentially like a handy sort of transitional um thing to get people's um eye on stuff but it's still it still basically places the human on the outside of nature and not seeing that that embeddedness uh because when you're on the out outside of it you're still observing a system that you're thinking you're outside the system rather than acknowledging or realizing that you're part of a, a sentient system that's observing itself um you know and and unless you're part of that system then I know you get all those observer effects, et cetera. But, you know, also, um, <clears throat> yeah, you you continuing to alienate your point of view and, and your knowledge is going to be alienated. I guess it's like, um, you know, so a, a pseudoscience, I wouldn't mind throwing this definition out there to everybody because I think this is a problem in the world now and that it's part of what you're talking about. Um, pseudoscience, I'd like to hear people's definitions of that. Um, so I, as, as far as I can see, a pseudoscience is a science that depends, you know, for all of its knowledge, it depends on, on being a counterpoint to another system of knowledge. You know what I mean? So, you know, every fact is a fact that sits in opposition to a, an alternative fact on the other side. Does you're it make that, any that, You're saying is that the pseudo qualification or that's the science of it? No, I think that's that's what pseudoscience is. Like I think the definition of pseudoscience is a body of knowledge where every part of that knowledge is um, basically only exists in opposition to um, to like you know science, for example. Um, and I think we we find this right across the board. So even in political science, it's basically you know someone's full of shit when they're um, basically their entire theoretical perspective or world perspective um, always has to be offset with. Uh, with with that of some enemy so they can't make a point of like you know my ideology says this bullet point without having that bullet point lined up with but the other side said this says this and they're wrong kind of thing okay. jamie you said something to me the other day about um people clutching clutching handfuls of ious mm. and i can't get that phrase out of my head <laughs> i think that's awesome and mm. uh, there's people who are holding the IOUs and then there's the people that we expect to pay them. And then we have, you know, uh, the divisions from along the lines of, you know, science and pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, for, to a large extent, um, I think there are a lot of pseudosciences running around out there. But to get back to uh, biomimicry, mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it a pseudoscience because, you know, it's not really against anything. Um you know, it works pretty well. There are some there are some decent models of it, and it's good for inventing Velcro and stuff like that. <laughs> but it's kind of like training wheels um, for like uh, real Im embeddedness uh, within a landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, which is your habitat, by the way. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, you know, I, I think I've shared this with you, Tyson. But you know, um, in my grad work, I was uh, studying under uh, a Lakota elder, Vine Deloria Jr., and he would often unpack, you know, indigenous ways of knowing. 
And one of the obvious ones was, hey, there are the animal nations. There's the, there are, there's the bison nation. There's the beaver nation. There are, there are all these different beings of which we're some. And we absolutely observe how the beaver builds his den and stays warm. And we absolutely observe how animals burrow or sleep or where they forage or how they find water. So there was, you, you I think, made a distinction of a potential less than fully healthy biomimicry. You said on the outside, looking in, observer effects, those kind of things. But is there a healthy version, you know, which was obviously first practiced by indigenous peoples everywhere, um, of simply being like, well, how do the other beings do it? And can we make the most of that? Because um, and I think we might have just lost Amanda, um, but um, the notion of intentional biomimicry, how can we, you know, whether it's tidal pools for energy creation or, you know, or kelp, fun, like there's a, there's a million beautiful, elegant solutions that are being innovated out there somewhere bridging attuning to nature, observing it, and then also leveraging our capacity to subject object, manipulate matter, de develop a scientific process, those kind of things. How would you steer that? What, what, what would be the key things for us to kind of bridge that divide from your point of view? I, I think at the intersection between um, biomimicry science and um, uh, complex, the complexity science, mm -hmm complexity sciences there i think i think you'll find some um groovy stuff coming out of that matrix mm -hmm. because i mean if you're able to um you know if you're able to see all of the externalities from the amazing invention that you created by sitting and listening to the mollusks you know um, <laughs> if you're able to see um all of the knock-on effects and where you're outsourcing your entropy to um you know with this solution that you design um yeah then then i think i think that's that's heading more in the right direction so um you know i think you could make like a little matrix with your biomimicry process or spiral if you like because you got to put it on a spiral because that's more natural or whatever <laughs> and then you could put your hey maybe you put your integral theory spiral along the top there steady you could have steady like on a, now we're through that get, phase. get yourself a <laughs> double helix going yeah. <laughs> with the uh, integral theory and your uh, biomimicry spiral. I don't know. I just find, um, you know, intersectionality doesn't always have to be about the IOUs. It can be, you know, a powerful tool you know, to have a look at the um, hybridization of different theories and disciplines and Beautiful. get them in dialogue, see what falls out. So uh, that might be a good way forward. Mm -hmm. um, but our, our way is, of course, it's very different. You, you do have to have first... You have to have a community and a society and a way of being that is part of the landscape. I mean, it doesn't just reflect the pattern of creation in the landscape in a particular bioregion, and therefore that bioregion is giving you your language, your governance system, your economy, everything else. Um, you know, it, it, you actually have it growing organically um, out of the, the spirit of a landscape. You know, as a sentient entity, and that's a completely different thing, because it's actually the land that's generating all of your systems, and those systems include, you know, knowledge production, knowledge transmission, and so your pedagogies are coming out of a sentient landscape as well, and you're just kind of all doing that together. Um, but in the meantime, while we're still small groups and individuals, uh, kind of pinging together in the Kardashian, you know internet breaking but cyberspace then um you know then maybe biomimicry is a a good a good placeholder for that mm. uh, until we can get back uh, to that landscape in that way mm -hmm. with if i heard you right right with with the the caution or the encouragement to not just slice and dice up nature in our effort to imitate it but a a closer almost i thou relationship like let's let's be let's be it let's be a part of it and let's mm. see what emerges and dennis that that brings to mind i mean obviously um dennis and his brother terence have went down famously infamously into the rainforest uh seeking adventure and and exotic compounds uh decades ago probably a few years before where buckminster fuller said we hit our inflection point and dennis you've dedicated your life to kind of bridging these worlds Right. I mean, molecular biology 
but with an interest, with a profound interest in native plants. I mean, not that any aren't, but from the vast biodiversity of, of Amazonia. Um, and, you know, both learning from them in situ, within the culture, within the context, within the place, and then also abstracting alkaloids and bringing the full weight of Western scientific method to your inquiry. So you literally, your entire life's work has been bridging these worlds. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on this dialogue? Well, um, thank you, Jamie. Uh, I, I've had, I've been having many thoughts as we look at this, uh, as, we, as I listen to this fantastic, stimulating discussion. Uh, uh, the, the point you make is true. I think that uh, one of the major lessons that we have to learn and if you spend time in nature in places like the Amazon and also through the catalysts of the, of the plant teachers, the psychedelics, the message that comes through again and again, if there's any one overarching me message is that we're not the boss. Nature is running this show. And our mission has to be to find a way to re-embed ourselves in nature because we've become so totally estranged from nature that we can't even think clearly about this. I mean, I, I'm not against biomimicry or all these technologies. I think that technologies inherently in and of themselves don't have any moral qualities. It depends on how the use that we make of them. But a lot of the technologies that we see coming forward is an indication that we're not trying to re-embed, we're looking at nature from the outside, you know, and the problem is we're not outside it. And this is what we have to understand that we are embedded in nature like it or not. So what we have to do is figure out how we're going to live in harmony with nature, not forsake technology, not forsake pro progress, but bring it together with natural knowledge, much of which probably the greater bulk of which has been uh, the preserve of indigenous peoples, you know, which has been largely disregarded for, I don't know, 10,000 years or so. But it's now time to start listening to those people because there's a vast store of accumulated wisdom from different cultures as to how you, as how we as humans comport ourselves in the natural environment. So we can't discount that. That's not scientific knowledge. Which, know. which bit, just rewind the tape. Which bit are you saying we can't discount? Indigenous knowledge, indigenous yeah. ways of know, knowing. It, it's not particularly scientific. I mean, it doesn't, there are scientific aspects to it in the sense that indigenous people probably more than anyone else are very acute observers of nature. They can perceive natural processes and intuit uh, aspects of it that are not obvious to us because they're not reductionist, you know, and they're not quantitative necessarily. This is what, this is what science has abandoned in the last 400 years. The idea that, you know, to be scientific, something must be reductionist. It must be measurable that sort of discounts the other ways of knowing that most of the world does not practice. That doesn't mean it's against science. It just means that science is a, uh, a small part of this. And, and by no means does it define the entire scope of, of the conversation. So I think we need to find a way to rediscover that natural wisdom that is both very ancient and also very contemporary in the sense that it represents cultures and societies that have had to deal with apocalypses of various kinds over the course of their existence. You know, the, the beginning of this first part of your discussion is called choose your own apocalypse. I don't think we have a choice. I, I think that we have to deal with several apocalypses that are, what is the plural of apocalypse, apocalypses or apocalypti, I'm not sure. Yes, that's matter. what I was gonna go with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it but, sounds fancy. We have several apocalypses in, in 
play right now that are happening and we don't get a choice. We have to figure out a way to ride the wave through all of them, you know, in some ways. And I, I, I tend to abjure the idea that, well, we'll just, we'll just skip over this. We'll just transform ourselves. We'll leave the planet. We'll make ourselves something other than human. Uh, that's not the mission. I don't think the mission is to become better humans, wiser humans, learn to live in, in harmony with nature, hard to do when there are 8 billion of us crawling across the planet, you know, but the thing is nature is calling the shots and will call the shots. The decisions that we make in the next 50 years, if we have that long, should be directed toward not what are we going to do about it. You know, it's not up to us. It, they should be directed toward how are we going to facilitate, to facilitate nature finding the solutions that are compatible with humanity's survival because nature will make those decisions. Mm. And it, it really doesn't care that much about us. It's up to us to kind of get into a place where we can ride, we can ride this wave. I have been thinking lately, there are many kinds of apocalypses. There are, but, you know, it, it seems clear that we are living through one right now. You know, the world has ended. The world as we know it has ended. Reality is changing. The next 10 to 50 years, depending on what the time frame, is going to be determined by what kind of transformational changes take place, much of which is not going to be under our control. So that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, we have to, I think, rediscover our role in nature, not assume that our our role is not to dominate nature. Our role is to work with nature, learn from it, learn from indigenous peoples who have been closer to nature for all these many thousands of millennia. There's wisdom there. I don't say there are simplistic solutions, but there's a better, more holistic understanding of what the challenges are. And I, I think that you know, we we can identify right now at least one at one. I've been thinking about fast and slow apocalypses, right? <laughs> the fast apocalypse is exactly that. You know, the mile wide, six mile wide asteroid that just smashes into us and resets everything. You know, and there's a case to be made for that, but one it doesn't matter whether there's a case to be made for it. It may or may not happen. It's beyond our control. Other types of apocalypses are slow. You know, the COVID is an example, and uh, there will be others like that that come along. I've been reading lately about the uh, precipitous drop in uh, fertility levels, in human fertility levels, largely traced to plastic pollution. And uh, the, the projection is that within 30 years, within 20 years, the rates of human reproduction will plunge precipitously. In some ways, that's a good thing, you know, because clearly at some level, one thing that's wrong is there are too damn many of us, you know, yeah. but you don't want a global catastrophe, at least not one no, that we call spinning. to wipe us out. Sorry. Uh, am I... No, that, that's that's great, Dennis. Um, and 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 what I'm hearing there's there's a there's a theme here of like splugy time zones. And, and I, my camera is just glitching, so bear with me. I think you all remember what I look like. Um, okay. Which is which is what Amanda said. Like Buckminster just talked about 1975, 1976. We're kind of in this after period of transformation. Um, you were just describing, hey, history's already ended. I often think of like the metaphor of tides. Like if you were looking at a tide table where the actual low tide begins, you know, the ocean's still seeping out, but there's still tons of kinetic energy. There's still tons of motion and movement heading in one direction before it kind of sucks back out to sea. And we, you know, people were like, oh, it's 2000 or, oh, you know, like Y2K or, oh, it's 2012 and Mayan calendar. You know, we, people have been calling the, the, the moment and technically whiffing. But on the other hand, we could have been right. It could have been Francis Fukuyama in 1989 writing the end of history and the last man. 
Um, so what I'd love to what I'd love to do, uh, Jules. I mean, as as a philosopher, and certainly as a philosopher with a particular bent for the weird, the apocalyptic, and the strange. Um, what is your thoughts? How, how would you integrate um, everything, you know, both Tyson's uh, pain to indigenous wisdom, Dennis's assessment of us really as irrevocably a subset of nature, um, and, you know, and, and even the sort of the futurism of Buckminster Fuller? What, how, how do you read this in your pattern language? Uh, thanks, Jamie. And I think you, you're the first to ascend to the singularity. You've become this rotating digital wheel. <laughs> so you've led the way. But anyway, listen, well done on this book. And it's it's great to just celebrate its launch with you. Um, I, I've been, um, it makes me think, I, I've been researching today um, Peter Thiel, the kind of transhumanist uh, investor, who's a big investor, one of the main investors in psychedelics, in uh, longevity research um, and other things like that. I had an amazing podcast conversation with him and the theologian N.T. Wright, the famous theologian. Um, and N.T. Wright believes in the coming of the kingdom of heaven in a biblical sense. And Peter Thiel grew up in evangelical. He also believes in the coming of the kingdom of heaven and immortality of the flesh. He just thinks science is going to get us there. And he's investing hundreds of millions to try and make the kingdom of heaven happen which doesn't sound too bad, but I also read that one of his favorite books is a book that came out in 1997 by um, a British journalist called William Rees Mogg, who's the dad of Jacob Rees Mogg, who's a kind of one of many posh idiots in the British government. And uh, William Rees Mogg says, we're entering the digital age and um, you know, it's, the, it's the end of the nation state because of digital currency. He was basically writing about cryptocurrency in 97. So nation states are going to run out of money. They're not going to be able to tax people. Uh, the welfare state's going to wither away. And basically, it's going to be the era of the sovereign individual, that there will be these transnational cognitive elite, and they will do incredibly well in this new era. Uh, and, and, and the rest of us will we'll just have to kind of fend for ourselves. And it was a chilling book. I, I, I read this book today, and it was a very chilling vision of, of the future. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I guess um, I think we, we do have to feel like we can choose our apocalypse, like nothing is inevitable, that there are still various different models of the future in play. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I don't know why he likes that awful book. I, I think it was, it was a kind of very chilling book. But I, as I read about people like uh, Musk and, and Thiel, these kind of transhumanist entrepreneurs, um, I think it's, it's, it's too easy in a way to dismiss them as just, you know, little boys dreaming of, of, of going to space. And, and I, 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 a bit of me is, is so, somewhat persuaded by their theory that, you know, actually technology is a lot about what, what's going to help us out of this situation. Um, and we need to keep dreaming about a, a kind of different tomorrow. We still need that vision of the apocalypse, you know, that vision of, of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and technology can help us get there. And so can things like spiritual techniques and psychedelics and the awesome intelligence of nature. So I guess I'm saying just that the, it, it's scary at the moment because there's so many different versions of the apocalypse bubbling up and some of them are really toxic, right? Like QAnon. But, and, and it makes you feel like, oh, can we just have critical thinking? Um, but I think in a way, like we're just going to ex expect it for the next 20 years or so, we're going to have more and more of these strange kind of rapture ideologies, as you, as you well noted, Jamie. Um, but there is a value in these kinds of rapture ideologies, which is that these myths are just kind of rocket fuel, aren't they? They drive us and motivate us and galvanize us to a vision of the future, if we can find one that's slightly less toxic than QAnon. Well, I mean, look, so many, so many interesting themes there, but let's beat on Peter Thiel for a while. Um, 
<laughs> so, I mean, A, I did not know that he grew up evangelical. Yeah. Um, and, and, and thinks of himself as a Christian. Yeah, and I'm always a little wigged when you come across tech bros that have deep apocalyptic religiosity in their software, because that is a, is a, is a, is a potent combo. Um, so talk to me about the fellow that you were talking with, the one who said about the kingdom of heaven kind of stuff. So just unpack and, and, and connect that, bring, bring that to life. More, um, that well, seems... So this is, this is a conversation you can find on YouTube between N.T. Wright, who's like the leading, I guess, the, one of the leading Christian theologians around. And he was having a conversation with Peter Thiel. Um, so, yeah, it's on YouTube. And N.T. Wright is a traditional Christian, believes in the coming, second coming of Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and and Peter Thiel emerges also believes in the kingdom of heaven. He just thinks it, we can get there soon and we can invest to make it happen. So he was saying that in a way, transhumanism is like another version of Christianity. It reminds me there's another investor called, I think he's called Brian Johnson. And he also invests in things like, he invests in a company called Kernel, which uh, with a K, which is like neural link. And he was from a Mormon background. And of course, Mormons are also kind of transhumanist. So, yeah, I mean, these, I, I think it's difficult to detach ourselves from myths. Maybe both, both you and I, Jamie, kind of think about uh, if we have a kind of empirical evidence-based spirituality, we can ditch some of the toxic stuff about religion. But when you look at like the new age in the 20th century uh, and, 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 and you know, spirituality, it's religion has a way of coming back. You know, myths have a way of coming back. Um, people have a way of getting that kind of the gleam in their eyes and the, the even getting a bit fanatical and exclusionary, like a, we, people like us, we're, we're, we're ascending into 5D consciousness, but you guys aren't, you know. So I think it's, it's tricky. We're just religious animals and you can be the most rationalist scientist and without realizing it, be a total religious dogmatist. Like we are just religious animals, I feel. And in a way, what that means is we kind of need theology to be conscious of what religions we're holding. Because I think a lot of people in the 20th century thought, oh, I'm post-religious, so I don't, I don't have dogma. But everyone's got dogma. You know what I mean? Whether they, It's just sometimes unexamined. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful point, um, which, is, which is, you know, it, it's that David Foster Wallace quote from This Is Water, where he says, everybody worships, right? The only question is what? And you better be careful about what you worship, because anything other than some form of the divine, whether it's money, power, fame, success, et cetera, you know, or science or scientism or pseudoscience, like anything less than that will eat you alive. So the question is, is how do we reclaim worship without being eaten alive? And, and, and that to me is, you know, fundamentally our inquiry. So, so this is beautiful. And, and thank you um, to, to everybody. And please continue to hang out for as long as you are interested in, and, and willing. Um, we're now at the top of our first hour. And, and even though we didn't necessarily get into um, all sorts of discussions about cultural fragmentation and identity politics and, and tribalism. Um, Amanda presents the notion of, you know, moving from a finite game, win, lose, up, down, you know, uh, tribalism to something resembling the infinite game, which, you know, which of which that Buckminster Fuller quote of hundred percent of humanity without offense to anybody or ecological detriment in the fastest possible time. If that's the project that we're trying to move towards a question is, it probably is deeper, you know, as both Tyson and Di shared with your own family's medical experience, right? It's probably deeper than like attaboys and a pat on the back or a pep talk. We actually have to have ways to materially defrag our nervous systems, actually do the healing, actually reconnect to what matters most in a, in a direct, visceral, abiding way, um, and meaningfully connect beyond our tribes and beyond our immediate spheres of finite game tribal interest. Um, so, so with that, I'd love to, if it's okay, you know, let, let's, let's move into the second part of the book, 
which is the Alchemist Cookbook. And, and while the thesis of that is, hey, what's a do-it-yourself kit that anyone anywhere can use to get to get these things, you know, or at least to begin these processes. Um, there is kind of an important piece of it, which was, to, you know, which is the setup. These are neurophysiological protocols. You can skin them however you want. You can add whatever layer of cultural or personal meaning to them that you want, but. If, you know, once you conduct those experiments and specifically just to kind of give context, you know, the use of respiration, sexuality, embodiment, music and substances. I mean, just they are, you know, there are there others. Absolutely. Uh, these are five of the most prominent and dominant. And if you look back back to the neuroanthropology, if you look back through three, four or five hundred thousand years of human experience, they're almost always in the mix in some, in some combinations. If you actually combine them and stack them into a you know, series of deliberate practices, they typically disclose very information rich states or experiences. And they're often quite salient, you know, meaning that they, are, they feel very relevant and real. And they're often um, quite profound in their personal significance or meaning. Beautiful. So that, that's the premise. Back to neuroanthropology, like how do we look to the past, see how we've done this human thing in the past, but then add the level of science, what's the inquiry and what is the functional mechanisms underneath our practices, habits, customs, rituals, and behaviors. And then we can strip out the mythologies that they typically come wrapped in um, and keep the technologies, keep the psychosocial technologies. And, and also just net, want, want to welcome Gabor Mate as well. So we're having, uh, and Doug Rushkoff, my goodness. Okay. This is just an embarrassment of riches um, of amazing people who have dedicated their lives and work to some form of pers you know, harnessing peak states, understanding and processing trauma and exploring the nature of connection. And, and again, uh, Leah and Greg have, have been here with us from the kickoff. Um, I, I wanna give this, because my sense is, is this, this, the music is, is obviously where, where my heart lies and what I, what I think is our solution. Um, but I'd love to just open the floor to Rick and Gabor, uh, Doug, um, welcome. And, and what are your senses as far as um, key insights about the relationship of peak states um, and healing of trauma. And, and, and Gabor and Rick, I wanna obviously turn it off over to you and Adam, I'd love you to loop in um, with any of your, you know, how your world of science is now bending and coming around to explore sh shared, shared spaces. Okay. Well, uh, Gabor, if it's all right, I'll, I'll start. And um, what I want to share is that we have this by peak states, if you mean, uh, Jamie, sort of like the mystical sense of connection, um, you know, we have this understanding that the LSD psilocybin research from the 50s and 60s demonstrated a correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes. And we've seen that over the last 20 years from the psilocybin research, um, the LSD research that we got started in Switzerland, that there is this, um, I'd say, shared finding on multiple different research teams that the depth of the mystical experience links to therapeutic outcomes. So for MDMA for PTSD, we use the mystical experience questionnaire, the same questionnaire that's used in the other studies. And surprisingly, people score pretty high on that measure even with MDMA. Not as high as they would with LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca or any of the classic psychedelics, but they score pretty high and around a quarter to a third of the people actually score above the 0.6, 60%, which is considered to be the full mystical experience. So people do quite high, uh, score quite high on the, the questionnaire in our studies. But the reason I mention all this is we do not see a correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and reduction in symptoms from PTSD. And I think that suggests that 
um, you know, we know that there is multi-generational trauma that didn't necessarily um, happen in your own biography that's passed along either in epigenetic manners or just through learning history about what's happened to your relatives or humanity in the past. Um, but for the kind of trauma that seems uh, anchored in, in this life, um, it seems that people need an intact ego to remember the things that happened to them or, or sometimes when it happened in early childhood, you don't have all the words for it, but you just have the feelings or the even sometimes bodily sensations. Um, and then to process those, to let those emotions out. So our therapeutic approach does not move people towards peak experiences if we define peak experiences by mystical, ego dissolution, more spiritual stuff. And a lot of the, the healing comes from just getting deeper into the trauma, but not being overwhelmed and stuck by it, being able to express it. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you meant by peak experiences, but. Well, I mean, A, and in fact, we also want to welcome Matt, John, Matt Johnson, uh, one of the lead researchers at Johns Hopkins University and, and, and a friend and colleague on a PTSD and breathwork study that we are uh, co-sponsoring and launching with Matt as the lead researcher. Um, so this is this is an amazing gathering of people, folks. So if you're if you're in this audience and just getting to see just the collective bodies of work um, and life impact, it's it's momentous. Um, and Matt recently wrote a what I think is a is a critically important paper. I think it came out in December. Is that right, Matt? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Where you were basically saying, I mean, A, the jangle fallacy, like when we say consciousness or when we say peak state, let's get, let's just slow our roll and get really clear on shared defined terms. So we're actually meaning the same thing as a transpersonal psychologist or a philosopher or a neuroscientist, or at least can agree in general zip codes. Um, and then, I mean, Rick, I, I think something that you shared with me when we were on a stage a couple of years ago was that is this right? If I if I remember correctly, where you said actually that patients on the MDMA protocols were actually often having better therapeutic insights and breakthroughs on 85 milligrams of MDMA versus the 150, that like lower dosage threshold was more therapeutically meaningful than just maxing out the neurochemistry. Well, in our study that we did with uh, firefighters, police officers, and veterans, 26 subjects, we did show that the group that got 75 milligrams, mm -hmm. followed two hours later or so by 37 and a half, okay. did a little bit better than the group that got 125 milligrams, followed by 62 and a half. Um, and that has caused us to change the design of our phase three studies. So now we've moved to, um, for, for money saving, reasons because it costs so much money for each dose. We have um, 60 milligram doses and 40 milligram doses. So what we've done in phase three is the first session, people get 40 milli uh, they get 80 milligrams, followed two hours later by 40. And then the second and third, they can go up to 120 with 60, or they can stay at the 80. Most people will go up. So what we showed in the earlier study was that uh, the 75 milligram group did do better, but they just through randomization, you don't always get exactly equal groups. So the 125 milligram group was scored higher initially, significantly higher on depression scores than the 75 milligram group. So we do think that the lower doses, um, which I didn't think would be that effective, were actually remarkably effective. And we are using them in our phase three, but most people then do move up to the 120 followed by 60 and that that dose seems to work really, really well as well. Beautiful. And just want to welcome uh, Julie Holland and Jeremy Wolf. And, and Julie is um, the New York Times bestselling author of Week Weekends at Bellevue and, and a number of other books on both cannabis and psychedelics and medical therapy. So just welcome, guys. And, and thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, Thanks and, for having us. Yeah, yeah. And, and Gabor, um, I saw you nodding along as, as Rick was initially making his kind of opening um, statements. Love you just to be able to kind of jump in because, I mean, you know, in, in my experience, my estimation, you're, you're kind of holding down um, a really important place in the field of trauma research and, and, and I, I hesitate to say activism, but real world um, application. So what are your thoughts on kind of passing this puzzle? Well, 
<clears throat> thanks for having me and i can only stay a short while because his commitments um i have to nod when you're speaking because he's my leader so when a leader speaks the uh, the, the disciple nods so that's that's just a mechanical thing that happens in my head um the uh, I'm not a trauma researcher. In fact, I'm not a researcher of any kind. Um, on the whole, actually, I'm rather impatient with research because very often research is trying to prove what I already know. So, and if I waited in my age, if I waited for all the research to come in, I'd be, um, by the time all the results are in and everything's validated, as the Hungarians say, I'd be smelling the flowers from below. In other words, I'd be in my grave. So I don't have much, I mean, I, I, I salute the researchers and it's all essential, but I don't wait for it. So more, 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 more than anything else, I'm a clinician. I just work with stuff. And then I talk about with what I see. So that's my background. And uh, as a physician, um, I came to uh, psychedelics specifically because I knew nothing about them. And people kept asking me why you don't know anything about them. And you talk about addiction and trauma, how come you don't know about Ayahuasca, and I got sick of the question, so I experienced it, and, and then I knew. And in terms of peak states, you know, um, I, just speaking about myself, I uh, I struggle enough just to be in a ordinary balanced state. Never mind peak state, you know. So peak states is something that have largely eluded me for all the experience that I've had with any number of substances and venues. Uh, I've had glimpses or short experiences, but I've never had that complete sense of unitary belonging and melding with the universe and godhood that other people describe. I just haven't. And um, I can believe that they exist, but I'm not the one to talk about them. Now, on the other hand, my wife had an experience like that once completely without psychedelics. And it happened at a moment where we were having a terrible time in our relationship and I was making her feel totally miserable and she surrendered to the misery and all of a sudden everything was energy and oneness and love and light. Nothing to do with any substances. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak personally about peak states so much. What I can say is that when I've experienced glimpses of them, it's very much like Rick says, they don't persist if they don't integrate with my life and how I feel about myself and what traumatic imprint I carry. So I've been far more interested in the psychedelic work as in my work in general. I've been far more interested in help, helping people deal with trauma and how that trauma shows up in their daily lives, in their relationships, in their self-image, in their, how they see the world, than in helping anybody achieve peak states. If peak states happen, wonderful. But mm -hmm. they've never been the goal. The goal is, how can these experiences open your eyes to what's real inside you? And what's real inside you can be the tremendous pain, terror, fear, rage, and hatred that you carry. It can also be the love and the belonging and the compassion and the courage and the clarity. Hmm. And so for me, it's all about what do these experiences allow us to see about ourselves that is real? And then how can we carry what we've learned into our lives. Mm -hmm. And I just close by saying that I've had experiences, including not that long ago, where it was truly wonderful. And I experienced a kind of blissful presence and peace that was somewhat new to me. <laughs> and I thought, okay, great. I've got, now, I've got the philosopher's stone now, you know? And then three weeks later, I was a complete mess. I was like, I'd never learned anything. I'd never seen anything. I'd never... Um, experienced anything. No, it's balanced again, you know? So it's not totally lost. But yeah. it's not about the experience so much as what can you carry from the experience and how can you integrate it into your life? That's what really matters to me. So, and, and, and of course, the big issue that gets in people's way is exactly as Rick said, is trauma. So those are my remarks. Hmm. Thank you. That what you just described, the philosopher's stone. Um, there's a beautiful poem by Gary Snyder um, called "Avocado," and he's like, "The Dharma, you know, is like the avocado." And he's like, "Some of it, some bits are ripe and awesome, but other parts slip through your fingers, gets away, you know." And so that 
that slippery nature of finding that 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 infinite thing and then losing it. I mean, what occurs to me, Gabor, as you're talking and Rick, knowing your, you know, as you've shared your family backstory, Greg, you're, you know, holding down and bearing witness to the African American musical tradition of jazz and blues. Leah, you know, your experiences with the deep, you know, some often gothic Appalachian folk that in many respects, like all of you are holding and bearing witness to post-tragic humanity, like something either in your own lives or in your own families or lineages or experience is, is about the breaking open and about the continuing anyway. And, and so just, you know, that's not intentional, but it kind of actually is because you are the folks that I wanted to be here to be a part of this conversation. So, you know, and to anybody that's listening, that that is also true for, right? Like, thank you. You know, because the, a pre-tragic move would be like, yay, psychedelics or yay, breath work or yay, you know, nine volt headsets, and it'll get us out of this versus there, there is, you know, no one gets out of here alive. And how do we, how do we rise up? singing. So, so Gabor, I know your time is, is, is finite, so I'd love to be able to ask a follow-up question. And it actually came from the last interview that I got to do with you, because you were basically making a, a very compelling case that, you know, that trauma would, is at the heart of most childhood dysfunctions, including ADD, most depression, anxiety, addiction, all of these elements. And we got to this fascinating place in that dialogue. And I literally have you know, not found the answer since, which is if that's true, and, you know, and I think you could make a compelling case, it, it's structurally in the mix, then what distinguishes the people who make it to the post-tragic, who get back up after being broken open versus the people that are just broken by it and either seek to regress or get locked in locked in stasis. What, what is that differentiator? And then, and then Julie, Matt, um, Adam, anybody else, please, please jump into this because you guys have rich, rich experience sets as well. So um, two comments on that, uh, Jamie. Uh, one is that no two things, no, no same things happen to any two people. You can never compare degrees of suffering. Uh, for the same reason, for the simple reason that the experience can be outwardly dissimilar, but they experience differently and process differently on the kind of temperament, the nervous system that you have. And some people are just born more sensitive. No, the more sensitive you are, sincere from the Latin word, sincere to feel, the more sensitive you are, the more the same. If I tap myself on the shoulder, and now this is the simple example I always give, it doesn't hurt. But if I my shoulder was bare and there was a burn there. So the nerve endings were close to the surface. In other words, if I was thin skinned <laughs> and if I tap myself on the shoulder with the same force, now the pain would be excruciating. And one thing we do know is that sensitivity is significantly genetic. It's not only genetic, but it's also some genes contribute to that. So two experiences, but they're refracted through different nervous systems. So they're not the same experience at all. Mm -hmm. That's, and, and the more sensitive you are, the more hurt you are, the more you have to defend against the pain and being stuck in the way you describe is actually a defense against pain. Number one. Number two, it all depends on the context. So the same thing's gonna happen to the two different people, but does the one person have one empathetic witness in their life mm. who can hear and validate their suffering, who can validate their feelings, who can maybe not even necessarily rescue the individual, but I can at least validate them. In other words, resilience is not an individual quality, it's a social quality. Mm -hmm. And it's a relational quality. It's a relational quality. So again, the one person may have had that, what, what Alice Miller calls the empathetic witness, the other may not have had it. So therefore, you can never say that two people had the same experiences. The final comment I'll make, is used you use the word broken I, I don't use that language about anybody nobody's broken because what we i think all of us 
who've done this work, you know, the people I see in the screen here right now, many others who are not on the screen, but who've been involved in this work, we know that there are miracles of, of, of healing and recovery in all kinds of seemingly hopeless situations, which means that fundamentally, the true self is never broken. It's always there. You may have lost sight of it. And what looks like brokenness is actually a disconnection from our, our, our deeper self. And that connection can always be made. So I never, I would never say to anybody or about anybody that they're broken. What I say about them is that they're disconnected. And then the question becomes, how do we promote connection? Which I think what this whole conversation is about. And, and your query into meaning, inquiry into meaning, what is that about? If not, it's a quest for connection with yourself so that you know why you're here. Mm. what you're meant to do uh, internally, not as, the, not as imposed on you by the expectations of anybody else. So again, those are my answers, but I, 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 I would drop the language of brokenness. Beautiful. That reminds me of that bluegrass tune, like brother, you know, I'm, I'm broken and you know, I, I ain't broke, but brother, I'm badly bent, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and of course, like with the singing to come back, um, Julie, I mean, your your work has also spanned the gamut, right? Between sort of quote unquote optimizing via neuropharmacological interventions, but also folks, you know, in institutional situations, you know, deeply struggling with just base reality. Um, what's your sense of this? I mean, I mean, I mean, build with Gabor and, and well, a few things. Um... I think this issue of resilience, you know, if I think about resilience from a pharmacological perspective, like the first thing I think is that you need to be in parasympathetic and not in sympathetic. Like if you want to bend and not break, you have to be in the rest, digest, repair mode. And repair is all about resilience. And it's not just that the body can repair itself in parasympathetic, but it's also that you have a chance to repair social disruptions. As long as you're in fight or flight, your social skills are shit. And, you know, it's going to be hard for you to have any real connections with people. It's only when you're in parasympathetic that you can rest, digest and repair. And that includes social stuff. But then, you know, the other thing when you talk about resilience, I think about cannabis. I think about the endocannabinoid system and how it's really is sort of designed to help us be resilient against stress. And, you know, the cortisol and the adrenaline come in and then the endocannabinoid system sort of comes in to right the ship. And the other piece of that is oxytocin the cortisol and the adrenaline come in from fight or flight, the oxytocin comes in and parasympathetic. And the oxytocin is what enables um, not only the relationships to get repaired, but also the body to get repaired in terms of wound healing. And you know the reason that hugs feel good and the reason that connecting feels good, or one of the reasons, is because of the endocannabinoid system. So we know that the endocannabinoid system is really involved with resilience. Um, and then the only other thing I want to say, Jamie, is you did this thing that I do a lot, which is like the sand coming through your fingers, right? You, you know, you think you've got this big epiphany uh, or mystical experience or whatever. You think you have the answers and then you come back and, and it's just kind of running through your fingers. You know, you need the integration to sort of keep what you learned. Um, I do think that there are some drugs that give me that uh, lost feeling consistently. Like whenever I have nitrous, I always have this feeling that I've. I had the answer and I lost it on the way back, you know, like consistently. But then I would say something like an MDMA assisted therapy session. You don't really lose it, you know, because of that methamphetamine base, you're awake and alert and there's a lot of oxytocin involved, but your, your memory is good. You don't, you don't have this sense that, oh, oh, I figured things out, but now I don't have it anymore. And so I know integration is important. Uh, it's crucial. I think, you know, you, you have these great epiphanies and then you don't know what to do with it. I, I get that that happens a lot. I have the sense that with MDMA, maybe it's not quite as difficult mm. to sort of integrate and figure it out, but I've definitely worked with patients who, you know, had profound realizations when they were in altered states. And when they kind of came back to their lives, it's really hard to integrate that information, you know, especially if they're like memories of trauma or abuse and you're still dealing with these people in your lives. Um, Jeremy, do you want to say anything about um, this? Just sort of building on what Gabor was saying about, um, about 
uh, what the, your surroundings and uh, you know when you come back or it, it, lots of cultures have have ceremonies or have communities that that are prepared to and have experience with dealing with people in the in these states and um, so there's a cultural component and the thing about culture is it evolves very rapidly and there's so there's that's a positive potential here is that you know human beings our senses don't evolve quickly but um, cultural culture evolve can evolve quickly and that the culture component of having um, uh, more of a safety net or whatever whatever it is or um, going back to some traditions that that help people in um, in these states is 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 out there mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and this is fascinating because it seems like there's a there's a two part question here, which is, it's Houston Smith's you know exhortation, which is, can we turn our passing illuminations into abiding light, right? Like, how do we how do we lasso starlight and actually grow corn with it? How do we do the things that matter in our world? And this is open to you know a- anybody on the panel, you know, um, Maddie, you know, any, anybody who's doing clinical research as well. My fledgling hypothesis right now, based on the content in the book, but the research done for it between Carl Dyseroth's work at Stanford on ketamine dissociation and three hertz delta wave activity, as well as the MIT anesthesiology study on nitrous oxide and double amplitude delta wave activity under the influence of nitrous, um, as well as 5-MeO has you know, cross-hemispheric uh, delta wave uh, radar plots uh, under, under peak state at least for that specific subcategory where high information epiphanic interior experience is correlated with Delta. One of the things that the MIT researchers found was, oh, it only, it only, you only get that double amplitude, deep waking Delta activity for three to 12 minutes, and then the brain normalizes. And that is potentially a neurochemical or a me- mechanistic explanation for why, like, oh, if I'm in that EEG signature, I have the secrets to the universe. As my brain starts powering back up and, and you know, presumably more prefrontal cortical activity, alpha to beta wave activity, et cetera, does it just kind of slip through my fingers because it's stored in a different filing cabinet? So is it, is it basically sort of where is the information encoded or disclosed versus where is it retrievable and processable? Um, and, and curious, what, what, do you, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Um, I don't, I don't know. Are you asking Matt, sir? Yeah, any anybody who's inclined. Oh, go ahead, Julie. Oh, great. Well, I don't, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about EEGs, but I am really interested in this three hertz issue because three hertz is three cycles per second, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. And the the Parkinsonian pill rolling tremor is three cycles per second, and the when you have a what's called petit mal or like an absence seizure where somebody's like lights on, nobody's home, it looks like this. The brain is wholly synchronized, synchronized in a three cycle per second mode. And that is a deeply altered state. So I do think there's something here with this idea of, of brain waves and altered states. But you're talking specifically about when you have that aha moment, everything is connected, everything makes sense, that that, that, that is a double amplitude and it lasts three to 12 minutes. And then and I think what you're saying is that because you shift back over to normal waking consciousness, you can't take that with you. And that is something that is called like state dependent learning, right? Like when you're sober, you cannot imagine what it's like to trip. And when you're tripping, you can't imagine what it's like to be sober. And so I think that that is, you know, to me, that's something like state dependent learning. But I, I personally couldn't say like, oh, well, because you're in this EEG waves and then you shifted to that, you're not going to be able to bring that over or remember it. I, I definitely don't know enough about, about learning and memory to make that assertion. Hmm. And one way to think about this is that n- not all of the lessons to be downloaded can be put into language. Um, some can. And, you know, we can talk about the nitrous oxide experience and that there might be a good amount of content in there that just is uh, pretty hard to stuff into language. Those revelatory effects that are just astonishingly common. Um, <laughs> And also, you know, not that I'm recommending any of this, but also quite common, like bizarre stuff with other, um, uh, with uh, the, the, the long chain hydrocarbons, people huffing, you know, um, you know, gasoline and toluene and whatnot. Um, people go to some really interesting revelatory places uh, there. 
But um, I, yeah, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, I, I think people, there's a portion in, in these uh, altered states that can be downloaded cognitively. In other words, you can tell yourself in your head what you learned. These are kind of the explicit insights. And then there's sort of a deeper knowing um, that one can carry with them. And I think uh, progress can be made on, on both of these levels and one shouldn't be too frustrated if it all doesn't download cognitively because it, it won't. And, um, you know, we're all biological organisms. We, it's homeostasis is the name of the game. We're not supposed to be happy all the time. We're not supposed to, if, you, if we had the answers to everything all the time and really acted like that, you just sit there and let yourself die. I mean, like we're playing the animal game, you know, like we, we can't be satisfied all the time. We're not really supposed to, and that's, that's okay. And so like, to what degree can we download these experiences, you know, mm. to the right degree in the right way when possible. And I'll say about the, the question about re resilience, I think, you know, there's just so many, as represented here, so many great perspectives. There's genetics and there's different neurotransmitter systems in, in, involved, but, you know, there's experience and experience is something that I think play also plays a very strong role. That's the thing, a portion of which we can affect, uh, unlike some of the others, like, like genetics. Um, of course, none of us can affect our past experience, but right now we're making a choice in even how to think about our past experience. So how we choose to think about our past experience is a choice of experience at this moment. And so that's the thing that's, and, and I strongly believe that there is a learning effect with resilience, how we deal with failure. And, and surely this is shaped throughout our lives, our childhood and into our adult life. And in fact, I've, I, in many ways, I think psychedelic experiences are a crash course and how someone deals with a situation where you're being annihilated. There's, there's two, at least two ways you can respond. You can absolutely freak out or you can kind of surrender to like the only reality there is. And so often people will come out saying that's a microcosm of essentially what life is, you know, are you going to fight the thing that you, you know, it's, it, there's no point in fighting or are you going to, you're going to work on the things you can work on and accept the things, you know, the serenity prayer. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like that, you know, I think experience shapes resilience and, mm -hmm. and even experience with psychedelic experiences can shape it. Beautiful. And Maddie, I'd love to just, I mean, because, both Gabor and Rick and Julie all kind of mentioned like, hey, there's states, but then there's also trauma, healing, integration, life, and arguably that's that's the real you know project. And just just share with folks because I I only, I only get to mention it you know it, you know briefly in the section on respiration in the book, but you are partnering with Stan Groff, the founder of Holotropic Breathwork and one of the godfathers of transpersonal psychology, standing up this project, you know, coming out of the psychedelic research division at Johns Hopkins, but not using psychedelics. So what are, what are you know, how are you designing this project for the PTSD and breathwork study? And, and, and what is the, you know, the, the sort of hope for it all and, and much love to Gabor. Um, yeah. What, what is your hope for that? Because to me, to me, that's always the interesting thing is it's less, which doors are we getting through? Because people can have hangups or, or presumptions or you know restrictions about any given doorway into these experiences is much more. What is the mechanisms of action, and then can we share more of that with more people? So it, it, it's a powerful project, and I think we can we can put in the in the chat the link um, to the recapturetherapture.com PTSD. And if anybody's interested in learning more about the study, please jump in there. Uh, it's, it's in partnership with Psychia and, and MAPS is also helping with the facilitation of the, the donation. So check it out as Maddie's talking, but tell us a little bit more about this project. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of the important uh, points in terms of my, my interest uh, as a background, Jamie, like, uh, you know, I'm interested in the doors and the keys. The keys are fascinating, like, you know, but, and psychedelics are really powerful keys, but ultimately you know, time and time again, the data that we and other people have published suggests that it's about the experience in terms of predicting long-term, even with the same dose of psilocybin, even with the same subjective strength of a psilocybin effect, it's about the qualitative nature of an experience that is predicting long-term 
improvements in well-being in the healthy normal, increased openness in, in the healthy person, uh, decreased anxiety, depression in the, in the cancer patients, decreased biologically confirmed smoking cessation in the person trying to quit smoking. So um, it's, it's, uh, if you're interested, if, if there's evidence that the experience is actually playing a causal role or something close to it, then yeah, you got to think broadly about, you know, hey, the, these methods such as Groff style holotropic breath work um, as as another vehicle, and I, I know the people you know here that I'm seeing. I'm all preaching to the choir, but that many people uh, report it gets to the same terrain, oftentimes. Uh, mm. And so, yeah. and and something that you and I touched base. I mean, we kind of like clicked on Jamie early on. It's like the whole idea of scalability. Here goes something, not a replacement for it. My thing is always like, we need more tools rather than fewer tools. But like, yeah, pushing forward with the psychedelics. But my God, if like, if we could find that, that breath work is helpful for PTSD in part, you know, um, driven by the idea that can we achieve similar psychedelic type experiences, mystical type experiences that might have this benefit. We don't need any FDA approval. Anybody at the VA that wants to implement this and has an empty room and some, you know, like they can just do it, you know, so scalability and anyone out there can just do it. Um, hmm. If you put it out there, you don't, you're not breaking a schedule one drug law. You know, if you're administering as a clinician, you don't need to wait for millions of dollars of phase, you know, two and three clinical research to be done and the regulatory bodies to approve it. So that's like, uh, you know, in addition to just, you know, personal experience that you know, has given me a taste of like, yeah, wow, this can really knock your socks off um, in terms of an experience. I, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a really good reason to push forward with this. And we went the direction of, of PTSD for, you know, for the same reasons of, for the interest in, you know, MDMA and psilocybin research and treatment of PTSD, obviously what an important piece to, to, to treat, uh, what an important disorder to treat. Um, Time and time again, I like in studies not looking at nominally trauma-based, um, you know, disorders like you know tobacco addiction and uh, depression and cancer-related distress, trauma comes up, and sometimes it comes up like the floodgates absolutely open, you know, like a, a cigarette smoker in her sixties that was severely uh, suffered severe domestic um, abuse almost 40 years ago um, and had to leave an infant child, for example, that's how intense it was, you know, leaving the abusive husband and, and the rest of the family and never shared it with anyone professionally, never processed it even with friends. And, you know, even though you do your best to kind of like, you know, get to know folks and whatnot, sometimes these things are still in the basement and man, it's like, this is just one of many examples. Uh, pretty much. It just, right. It just, uh, you know, the floodgates open. So I've seen time and time oh, again. Get ready and yeah, I've seen time and time again when we're not treating PTSD, that trauma comes up. And wow, within this model, it can really be processed in a healthy way. Um, so, so that's part of my interest in, you know, and, and also the trauma focus. Beautiful. Well, I'll, I'll just add, Jamie, very quickly that uh, whole trope of breathwork can indeed be helpful for PTSD. I mean, it, re it really is a great tool. And a lot of, um, not a lot, but some underground therapists work with, or above ground could as well, but work with breath work first, and then they see how people respond, and then they move into work with other psychedelics. But Stan said something hilarious, uh, it's sort of worth sharing, because you were saying that anybody could just do this holotropic breath work. He talked about how he developed holotropic breath work because nobody could make breathing illegal. But it turned out that the French were able to do it. So they criminalized holotropic breath work because wow. they, said that it, they said that it was part of a cult and they have all these laws against cults in France. So they decided holotropic breath work is a cult and they criminalized it. So, uh, but, but for everywhere else, uh, you know, you can just do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, and, you know, and a, just, you know, to, to be, mentioning Stan and to know that, that, you know, he's in relationship with a number of the folks here, just to, again, to, um, I just want to, you know, pour a proverbial 40 on the curb for like the collected lineages and beauty and wisdom and of, of, of all of the folks gathered here. 
um, and including many folks in the audience and just deep appreciation for the intergenerational um, shared project, um, truly. And and for what Rick's doing, with, like with the MAPS research, right? I mean, it was a conversation, Rick, that you had with me about the MDMA creating the high vasopressin prolactin oxytocin state comparable to post-orgasm like that led a whole chunk of research into sexuality as prescription pharmaceutical and its potential healing benefits. Matt's just been speaking about respiration. Julie's just been speaking about the neurochemistry in similar ways. Like I, we're, we're getting increasingly close to a true open source toolkit of sort of like humans, a user manual, like here's how we do this thing. And there's no getting out of it. And it's lumpy and bumpy, but it's also awesome sometimes. And we, and it's more fun together. So, um, just thank you guys for that. And, and again, um, check out the link, um, recapture the rapture.com, I think backslash PTSD. Um, and, uh, a member of our community has very, very generously offered to match funds up to a hundred thousand dollars. So if we can raise another hundred thousand, that's $200,000 towards the study. So every dollar you do, you contribute is doubled in impact. Um, and that's going to make this possible. And it's, targeted to go out, as Matt said, to veterans, um, as well as 5 million kids in South America, Africa, and India who need it deeply and desperately to be able to defrag their nervous systems to be able to show up to learn. So if you, know, if you feel like it, this is, this is a pledge drive for an awesome thing. So please, please consider doing that. Now, now, I'd love to take this concept, which is how do we heal in some form of dialogue or, or dialectic between our peaks and feeling our best and, and our most broken open. Um, there's also some remarkably ancient and low-tech versions, um, sometimes with just acoustic strings and, and, and wood and sometimes plugged in like Dylan at Newport, right? So I'd love to bring uh, Leah and Greg into this conversation, which is how do we get large groups of people to feel inspired and connected and healed? So this kind of, you know, we can kind of segue into what for me is like literally my favorite part of the writing the entire book, which was a love letter to the American songbook and to the American song tradition. Because this idea of like, well, if we're trying to create an open source, scalable, blah, 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 meaning 3.0, then who's going to build it and who tells us what to think and believe and all that? And you're like, no, no, no. The answers are in our texts. Like the answers are all around us. And everything from the African-American slave and spiritual tradition as that bled into gospel and blues, folk, protest movements, everything. So I'm just teeing up now. Um, Leah, would love to hear from you and your experience um, as both growing up between, you know, Appalachian, bluegrass, fiddle camps, and everything else, your experience in Atlanta, and very much the exact opposite, the kind of urban experience of the South, and what you've done um, with your sister and the rest of Rising Appalachia to bring this music to the world, and how does it speak to you and through you guys? Well, I'm a total nerd, so I've been like taking notes on everybody's talks over here furiously because I'm like one part musician and probably like 50 part uh, mythology scholar and sort of obsessed with a lot of the conversations that we've already been having. And so I can't believe you said we're going to pour a proverbial 40 on the curve for starters. I would just like to earmark that as an epic Epic uh, segue. I, that really, <laughs> well done. Um, and I'm going to backtrack a couple of pieces and then I'll, I'll keep going. But um, it's really interesting to hear from everybody and just kind of percolate on all of these thoughts around, I think, the general concept of resilience and kind of crisis management, which I think is what we're doing all around the world right now. Um, <clears throat> we started the conversation around the medical institutes and moved into, you know, in, in indigenous wisdom keeping and also spiritual realms. And I am a really big lover of mythology. Um, and it's interesting because somewhere in the conversation, there was this idea that actually we should debunk myth so that we can actually re um, rewire. And I, I believe a lot of my artistry and a lot of my, 
a lot of my poetry and a lot of my spiritual practice is actually tied to trying to find access to retell and rewrite and rewire a lot of our, our myths and our, our mythology um, in a way that <clears throat> I think gives us foundation and answers to so many of these enormous existential crises. Um, because no matter where you come from, no matter what your lineage or what your corner of the world, you have stories of destruction, there are stories of uplift, there are stories of sexuality, there are stories of, of the way that we relate um, to crisis and the way that we rebuild from crisis. So that is actually a really enormous part of the bedrock of where I think my, my vantage point and my leaning comes from. Um, it's been really interesting, and I think since everyone has spoken very vulnerably, you know, for us, our work in the world has been uh, what we consider a social service, you know, and I think our work in Rising Appalachia and our work at large has not just been art for art's sake, but has sort of been a social service. And I think being removed from that realm and what Gabor Mate said, resilience is not an individual quality, it's a, it's a social quality. That was a really powerful thing to think about because we've been removed from our ability to sort of create in that social sphere. And it has caused, I think, in, in the realms of artistry and in the realms of, of creativity, an enormous identity crisis where it's actually wonderful to hear everyone talking about how to rebuild and, and restabilize from there because without that engagement, without the, the, the feeling of the exchange of the songs and the sounds and the crowds and the dancing, you know, there is a lot, um, there is a lot more, I think, of the existential moments. And, and I love that this conversation is, is turned towards that idea of like a jazz, a jazz improv, you know, where that so much of art and music has to do with reflecting off of and responding to each other. And, and um, I'm gonna tell you one other story and then, and then I'm really excited to kind of bounce back the ideas of where the art is. But, you know, I lived in New Orleans for a long time, many, 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 many years. And, and the culture of New Orleans is very deeply in the streets and I am in Appalachia right now, um, not far from where somebody called in from earlier. I mean, I've split my time between kind of, like you said, the urban and the rural and, and the, that mountain and the, and the city. And, and in New Orleans, the jazz and the, and the street performance is, is very much in the streets. It's very much a daily currency. It's a vernacular. Um, and one year there was a, there was, the rapture was coming actually, probably like, eight years ago, there was this, there were billboards everywhere. And for some reason, the, th the idea was that the rapture was coming. And there were all of these really interesting <clears throat> Christian camps that had set up all over New Orleans, and they were protesting all over. And it was like the rapture was coming. And it was doomsday. And I feel like this was talked about too, about how there's always apocalypse. We're always kind of pending on apocalypse. I mean, I think we're on a pretty serious one now. But <laughs> there was this doomsday rapture moment. And the community of New Orleans decided instead of like fighting this onslaught of kind of religious fanaticism that they were going to take it on and turn it into an art project. And so hmm. the rap, there were, there were rapture mixtapes, there were rapture t-shirts. And then the day the rapture was supposed to come, which I think was like October 12th, 2012 or something like this. I don't remember. Somebody, some crew of New Orleanian artists went to the thrift store and bought like 250 shoes. And they dropped the shoes off in the middle of downtown New Orleans, just right in the French Quarter where there's all the street busking and everything. They had a pile of shoes and they filled it with dry ice. So all day it just smoked. And they were like, rapture. Those of you that went, good luck. The rest of us are here in New Orleans and we're freaking thankful for it. So... <laughs> I am so excited to conjure the conversation of how art can be our tool of repair and rebuilding and restabilizing and finding our kind of juju and our vitality and navigating this rocky mess of the world that we're sitting in right now. And I believe and I have a lot of faith in it. And, you know, 
I hand it over to you, Greg, because I would love to hear your thoughts on, on where that takes you as well. Thank you so much, Leah. And thank you, Jamie. Um, I, I want to show this book that uh, is the <laughs> basis of our conversation. I'm so happy my copy came yesterday. I can't wait to oh, nice. dig into it. Yeah. So, wow, so much. I want to start with what you said about uh, myth, Leah. Um, I think we, when we talk about myth and what um, Albert Murray, my mentor, called the mythosphere, we're talking about the imaginal space, you know, so we're tapping, you know, that's soul craft work, you know, um, and soul force, which is a, a term that Jamie likes to use. So that's very important. Wynton Marsalis, one of the best known, probably the best known jazz musician of his generation, you know, it talks about the need for us to have a new myth in, in America. Um, He's from New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz. So that, that's fitting. Uh, resilience. Wow. Uh, I love that. Resilience is a social quality. That's so powerful because when we look at the Black American cultural tradition, the musical tradition, um, there's something that Murray called the blues idiom, right? And I call it the blues idiom wisdom tradition. So what I like to do is just very quickly share a couple of quick quotes that characterize this in your book, Jamie. Thank you so much. You you quoted from Murray and his book, The Hero in the Blues. You quoted from Stanley Crouch, um, who's the person from whom I learned about the work of Albert Murray and also Ralph Ellison. Ellison and Murray were very tight. So in a 1945 essay, Richard Rice Blues, Ellison actually described poetically what the blues is. And I think that it'll add to yeah. our, our discussion. He said, the blues is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain and to transcend it not by the constellation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near comic lyricism. As a form, the blues is an autobiographical chronicle of personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. Okay? So, yeah, yeah. One of the things that, that, that Murray uh, would say, he said, you know, people create what they need. So he says, you know, black folks didn't have psychoanalysis. So what did we do? We created the blues. So this, this blues idiom that uh, is a term he coined, um, he was once asked in 1996, well, what is the blues idiom? This is what Murray said. It's an attitude of affirmation in the face of difficulty, of improvisation in the face of challenge. It means that you acknowledge that life is a low down dirty shame, yet confront that fact with perseverance, with humor, and above all with elegance. Mm -hmm. so, so that was Murray's description. And, and what I'd just like to add in closing is that you know, this blues idiom wisdom tradition that, that I'm coining is really part of the existential equipment for living that was derived from the lived embodied experience of black Americans and black American culture. You know, and there's truth, goodness, and beauty in that tradition, but it's not just confined to black Americans, um, you know, my ancestors and their descendants, because whenever you have a cultural gift, like the blues, gospel, R&B, funk, soul, and the like, once it's innovated in the world, it becomes a, a gift to the world. So this blues idiom wisdom tradition is, is available to all of us. And if we can transcend, and I'll close with this, the fakery and what Stanley Crouch called the decoy of race and embrace the infinite cosmic game of culture, we can then intelligently choose such embodied wisdom. Can I get a, can I get a, Ooh. amen. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, 
at this point, I just wish we could all just unplug, have a happy hour, play some tunes um, and be together. So for sure. And, and, and I'm just, I experience, I'm experiencing like profound gratitude for everybody effectively like wielding their Thor's hammer. You know, our, our buddy Jordan Hall, who's uh, uh, familiar to many folks on Rebel Wisdom, we were in the midst of COVID, like right last, like this time last year, like total shit show wheels off, like must rally help. And he's like, you know, but Thor's hammer is infinitely heavy for anybody but Thor. It's impossible to lift. It's like Excalibur, right? But if, if it's yours to wield, then it's effortless and mighty. So like find, find our Thor's hammer and each of you clearly have, right? And it's not that it's, oh, neuroscience is going to fix it or save the day or, oh, trauma therapy or, or even, ah, uh, it's, it's all of them or civilization design and futurism and just profound gratitude for all of you embodying the thing that we all need to do more of together. Um, and we can keep, I'd love to keep riffing on, on music and the Arcana Americana. Di, I, I, I mean, I'd love to, Di, you're on the hot seat, just so you know, for culty cults um, coming up. But um, I'd love your thought as a Western Zen teacher about this, na this nature of broke openness, because I think there is something beautiful from what Rick and Matt and Gabor and Julie and, and Jeremy were talking about, right? The kind of the nature of trauma and the nature of healing. And then if we're not careful, we can kind of get sucked into the perfectibility, fixability. We're broken and we're just missing a few parts and we'll, we'll set you right up. The kind of mechanistic model of integration to normalcy. But what Leah, what you and Greg have been speaking to really beautifully as you presence the traditions you guys are sort of students and, and masters of is, is, nah, there's no getting off this ride. Right, it's it's the testifying and the metabolizing and the alchemizing of those inescapable human conditions. So, as far as inescapable human conditions, die, you're my go-to. I, well, I, I left oh, you all. Oh, I left everyone hanging with my tragedy in the medical yes. system. Right, we where where no one was able to receive me and my my disabled child and we were just left, you know, we were adrift. So if you guys will hold on for one more second, this happened. And what I do want to say is the one thing that in the conversation just a few minutes ago, we're, we're talking about music, but let me just go back just one prior to that. There's a line in, in one of the very famous poems of Zen, to encounter the absolute is not yet enlightenment. The koan is how does one manifest and bring it into the world? And whether it's art, whether it's through acts of compassion, acts of forgiveness, acts of uh, creativity, but it's the, it's the realization that the that the suffering is also something that's here to serve our our deepest being and also our evolution. So I want to get you the Rumi poem that was waiting for me when I came home from being with my son. So hold on for one sec. I'll be right there. Talk among yourselves. Beautiful. And. And Doug, it's nice. It's wonderful to see your face as well. So everybody, Doug Rushkoff, Thorn Rocks of the Google Bus, uh, Team Human, obviously the most apropos of your work, but really just a, a continuation of a long thread of reflecting. And Doug is one of the stars of the introduction to the book. So uh, one of your awesome tales <laughs> of the absurd um, actually tees up the whole kickoff to, to recapture the rapture. So um, Doug, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, you've, you've made a play and, and, and dive, well, actually I'll tell you what, if, if welcome and we'll, and we'll come back to you immediately after, uh, after die. So this is really funny. So I had this really difficult experience, but because of my years of training, being present to what is being present to Two o'clock in the morning, psychiatric, psychiatric doctor, not able to receive comfort, nurture it, or give hope. That's fine. He was just doing what he was doing. Turning to my son, bringing my son, son home, and just taking care on a basic level. You know, so much for the antipsychotics. You know, just being present and caring. And then I, I somehow, it was like two in the morning, and I open this crazy folder and there's a bunch of paper in there and it's all empty. 
except for this one at the very beginning, and it says undressing. So may I read it to you all? It says, learn the alchemy two human beings know. The moment you accept what troubles you've been given, the door will open. Welcome difficulty as a familiar comrade. Joke with torment brought by the friend. Sorrows are the rags of old clothes and jackets that serve to cover and then are taken off that, un oh, and then are taken off. That undressing and the naked body underneath is the sweetness that comes after grief. So that was my, my little message I got that evening after I came home. So, and, and um, where, did, where did it come from? Like, do you know who wrote it? I'm, I'm a, it sounds to me like a Sufi. I mean, I think it's probably Rumi or Hafiz or someone like that. But I, it's in my handwriting, and I don't know who the author is. Oh, wow. And it's, yeah, it was in this folder with literally all this paper. I mean, none of the other pages had anything on them. And this was my little, my little moment that I received, you know, from, from the divine will, you know, so... So I, um, I guess I also just want to put the word compassion into the conversation, along with art and creativity and the, the capacity of the human heart, because as we know, the mind and its tremendous capacity to uh, perceive opposition, a little bit back to what uh, Tyson said in the very beginning, that dualistic tendency, which is so great for architecture and for science, but for encompassing the experience of of this massive duality of being human the human heart is the it's the intelligence you know it's the one that we need most so that's what i would say right now jamie thank you thanks beautiful thank you diane um leah i'm, I'm also curious i mean i don't know i i, I haven't seen the the arc of your guys growth over the last few years but judging i'm guessing that you know you've been experiencing larger and larger crowds of people i mean obviously minus the last 12 months um what's been your experience of sharing you know 18th 19th century songs obviously some of your originals that play within those idioms what has it been like for you guys to yeah to basically reintroduce an entire new generation um to this traditional songbook and 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 what are some of your favorite moments or even songs or even just like lyrics that clearly ripple through the crowd and, and connect. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah. Our, it's, it's nice that you're familiar with our work, you know, because we used to coin ourselves like the, we were, we were like the folk music band at every electronic music festival the world over. And it was the strangest job ever because we'd get to the stage and and the sound engineer would be like what what is that and we'd be like well this is a guitar you know <laughs> a guitar. not a laptop it doesn't it's, 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 a, it's a guitar it's, it's like the original instruments and and our whole uh, upbringing was in the folk music tradition and it felt like it was very much kind of has been part of our duty really as much as we would love to be playing in jazz bars and and at folk music festivals to actually be the folk musicians at a lot of these gatherings that are primarily tilted towards towards the technological electronic side of music because i think it pulls you back to a sense of of an archaic sense of self to hear an old ballad or to hear an instrument made out of wood and strings you know we all come from the realms of art and creativity from all of our all of our ancestors we're singers and song catchers and and so that's been part of our duty you know has been to find a way to, to gather this old music and we started in our own backyard so we started in our in our family's home my mother's a fiddle player and a and a gospel singer. My father's a blues guitarist. Uh, we grew up in Atlanta, between Atlanta and Appalachia, like I said. And and so we gathered first from the Southern traditions and the Southern vernacular, and then and then stretched down into the Louisiana 
traditions and then moved up into French Canadian traditions and went over into Eastern European and Northern Irish traditions and into West African traditions and over into India and now just work the material of traditional music. We really try and catch it and harness it. And it's a muse, it's very ethereal. It doesn't just arrive in your, in your lap. It's something that you have to kind of chase and court. But I think that, like what I was saying earlier, I deeply believe, and Greg, you spoke to it so beautifully around the responsibility and the roles that this music plays and that, and that these old traditions hold to get us through hardship. And when this year started, and it has been hard for us as well, um, I think it's been hard for everybody. We were looking into our song database and we were like, well, we've got medicine, it's about traditional medicine keeping. We've got Resilient, which is a song about staying hard when times are challenging. We've got, uh, we've got I Believe in Being Ready, which is an old archaic kind of folk gospel song about the apocalypse and we were like dang did we just accidentally write like the apocalypse soundtrack here <laughs> yes yes that's why you're here <laughs> just tell you now yeah <laughs> we accidentally have been gathering all of these songs writing some of them and gathering a lot of them from old traditions that are about coming out of hardship and i think we have as a human culture a huge huge vernacular of tools and resources and the the, the piece of poetry and the piece of songs actually kind of feed a place that we can't necessarily touch with ration and with reason you know we can't really quite think all of these things through and you can you can touch those places like I, I study with an amazing poet named David White, and he says, you know, poetry is a street fighter. It's like mm. poetry can come in swinging, and it's not necessarily the, the right-brained response to, to problem-solving, you know? But I really appreciate, Jamie, that you, that you have done such a vast amount of research to bring the music and the songbook and the, and the studies of art into into these conversations, you know, because I think a lot of times it's, it's, it's not necessarily seen as a clear direct line to solutions, but I think it is this kind of mystical space holder that can get you out of exhaustion and trauma. And, and like you were speaking to Julie, also the kind of fight or flight, you can actually soften into some of these places where the creative spirit might come in and and take command and hopefully we can court that spirit in a way that it can swing into all of our lives a little heavier with all of its tools and resources to give us that kind of bedrock of of resilience really jamie can i say something very quickly about david white yeah of course i love his work i, I love the way he will repeat his lines in slightly different ways and it becomes like murray liked to talk about incantation and percussion of course that's the found a foundation of ritual and there's a ritualistic aspect to david white's approach to to reciting his poetry um and it and it's like it taps into this like mythic archaic mythopoetic space of being around the campfire or being on the porch telling stories and that type of thing i just i, I love his works so i really appreciate you mentioning him leah yeah and and greg just to echo something that you said earlier which was hey um these traditions this american songbook is the world's now because right now we're in hyper factualism and there's an awful lot of really rigid policing around cultural appropriation in all sorts of directions, uh, spiritual, musical, you know, sartorial, you name it, right? But that idea that this, this, is, this is ours, this is humanities, and it's there as a, as a tool and a resource. And the idea that if we, like, we don't have the time and we don't have the 
social technologies to process every single slight and every single grievance and every single trigger and every single wound. But the notion of music, collective music, um, effectively, you know, instead of like the truth and reconciliation committee, like the groove and reconciliation committee, <laughs> like, can we engage in batch forgiveness? Nice. And, and, you know, and it was Rick, uh, I was interviewing Rick, Wade Davis, Eric Davis, and Amy Cuddy all in the span of like three weeks this summer in, you know, for the podcast that are companions to the book. So it's on the website and feel free to, if you haven't seen those conversations, they're deeper dives with all these amazing folks, but all four of them spontaneously without me leading the witness all copped to an early initiatory experiences with the Grateful Dead. Whether there were psychedelics involved, we didn't, we didn't press the issue, but let's just say, you know, the Dionysian rite of initiation, right into that American songbook. And those guys were definitely a bridge between, between the folk gospel blues, et cetera, into something else. Um, that was the original thread, at least for me, that I was, I was tracking down. Um, and I just want, I just want to kind of conclude this notion, this, this section on kind of music and celebration. So we've been talking about ecstasis, catharsis, right? So peak states and trauma. We've been discussing the clinical, medical, pharmacological models, as well as even some of the Zen and, and philosophical. And there's just this notion, because I mean, you'll, you'll hear that, Leah, to your point, like you'll hear people be like, oh, in times of crisis, art's more, more important than ever. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, fruity, fruity person, you go do your you know thing. But it's so more profoundly central than that. It's not, it's not just artists rattling the tin cup to say, please pay attention. It's no, no, like art, music, dance, movement. Um, Robin Dunbar, that many folks who are familiar with at Oxford, the famous Dunbar number, 150 people can gather kind of thing, did a study of the San Bushman and the Kalahari and found that they engaged in trance dances to discharge social friction and tension, but that rather than only doing it in the good times, right, they, they had more trance dances, the more harsh and hard to survive the conditions were. I so love like, that part of the book. That chapter was very amazing. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, it's just beautiful. And then like Alice Walker has that title to her poems, like hard times call for furious dancing. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful way for us to conclude. Now, just, I just want to read a quick quote from Cornell West. Greg, yeah, you're, you're on mute, mate. Quick quote from Dizzy Gillespie. He told this when Murray interviewed him for Interview Magazine. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie said, dancing don't make you cry. Yes, beautiful. And, and, and there's the Hasidic prayer. It says there are nine levels of prayer. Above them all is song. And I love that one too. That's so good. <laughs> Isn't that good? So, so, so thank you. Soon. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go dance now. <laughs> yeah, dancing. exactly. So if everybody's getting, getting their yayas ready, we've been, we've been, obviously, we're in a, in a stationary conversation, but hopefully it is broad in the neosphere. I mm -hmm. uh, want to welcome um, Doug Reshkoff, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Brian Murray Rescue uh, as well to our conversation. Um, Brian is the author of the recent Immortality Key, uh, which was tracing Greek mystery cults into the early Christian tradition. I think you might have your good Catholic school boy card revoked. If it hasn't happened, it's pending. I, I, I know a guy. Um, Doug, as, as I mentioned before, uh, author of Team Human, um, Throwing Rocks of the Google Bus, and many others. And then Daniel is probably no stranger to most of you if you're familiar with rebel wisdom um, and anything to do with mapping, planning the future, and figuring out what we do next. So welcome. Welcome, guys. Yeah. So, so now we're going to move into that final third of the book which is effectively, um, you know, what do we do now? And, and how do we move forwards socially? So we're kind of going from, you know, if the middle section was sort of focusing on onesie twosies, you know, how do I remember what I forgot? How do I reaffirm my reason for being? How do I defrag my body, mind, and heart? And how do I connect in small scale trust and intimacy? The next phase is, how do we do this? And as, as Tyson um, beautifully said in, in his book, you know, how do we take our kinship pairs, like a couple of people, a family unit, whatever that might be, and then connect them with other kinship pairs and those pairs with pairs? And how do we actually knit together 
And then, you know, again, make, we can use biomimicry redeemed as, as a working model here, which is in how do we grow this organically? Um, so, so Doug, um, you know, you, you put a stake in the ground a few years ago on Team Human, and it, it was a collection of essays, it was a collection of, of, of thoughts, but A, why'd you pick that title? And what is your sense of how, what it is and how we, and how we take a crack at it? Well, I mean, I picked a, a Team Human as a title, partly as a, you know, I've, I've had a kind of a weird bone to pick with Richard Dawkins for a long time and the selfish gene and the strident individual and Ayn Rand and the way that that sort of scientism dovetailed so easily with corporate capitalism and the cult of the individual and how that alienates us from one another. And, you know, they taught me in middle school that trees compete for sunlight. And then I find out as an adult, they share their nutrients through mushrooms under the soil. And I'm like, fuck this shit. Um, so Team Human just seemed like an easy way to say uh, both let's all do this together in an organism collaborative way, but also to take responsibility for the fact that that we're Team Human here and human beings in this Anthropocene, whatever era that we're in, we're having an, a, a big impact on all the others. And we got to um, get our get our act as a species together. So it's not Team Human against Team Animal or Team anybody else, but it's like this is our... This is our team. And then the, the, the main uh, 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 imperative of that book, you know, was the idea of just find the others, you know, first find the people, the other ones who want to do this, and then find the people who you think are other than you and, and figure out how to work, work and play with them. You know, but it, it's funny as, as I think about, you know, I was listening kind of pa passively to, to what we were talking about, to, to what you all were talking about before this. And I, I started to feel like, you know, we don't have to justify what we're doing in terms of science. You know, we don't, we, it's nice that we've got science to say, oh, you know, when I meditate, this happens. When I do nitrous, that happens. When I take acid, this happens. And it proves to the Dawkins people, you see, we're not just stone. There's something, you know, when I have sex, there's just all this stuff that's really happening and that's legitimate. And I've got numbers and data and facts that prove that this is good. Um, that's fine to a point. But now it's like, OK, we've proved to those guys that this is real. There's a certain place where if we think too much along those lines, I start to I start to interpret your question from the perspective of how do we instrumentalize this so it has the most utility value for the furtherance of our species. And there's a place between what we were just talking about and this stage that you're talking about now to the doing of it, where I think we've got to use all these facts, all these techniques and technologies to get us to the edge of the diving board. But then it, it becomes more, more human and spontaneous and weird and arty. And, <laughs> and, and it just, it's just, Really, what do you just have fun? Find other people, look in their eyes, play with them. You know, you, the, to use all of this work to 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 have enough confidence that well, all this stuff that we've been saying is true. We don't need to say it anymore. We can just we can just be together. You know. Once again, man, beautiful. Um, thank you. And, and yeah, you know, I, I think it's that Oliver Wendell Holmes thing of, I don't give a damn about the simplicity on this side of complexity, and I'd give my life for the simplicity on the other. And a number of times, and I think this is a critique that gets lobbed at um, rebel wisdom guests quite often, including me, um, which is, why are you so complicated? And it's like, promise, man, at the end of the day, it's music, good times, <clears throat> right? And, and people you love, getting weird, you know, but to unwind and prune the rat's nest we find ourselves ensnared in requires sometimes some surgical snips. Um, so for anybody out there, you know, listening along, even, even having a New Year's resolution to read the book, please know um, it is the simplicity on the other side. It is the, it's the courage and the peace that passeth all understanding. That's what we're shooting for. And it's arguably attainable, but it's, it's a hundred percent up to us. Um, 
So you made a fascinating distinction there, um, Doug, in, in what is, I'm assuming, is a riff on the Tim Leary quote, or like, do the unexpected, find the others. And you said, find the others, like your brothers and sisters, your like-minded playmates, but also find the other, the ones who are the opposite, who are not like you. Can you just unpack that a little bit? Because I've never heard that, and I thought that was a brilliant... Oh, yeah. well, well, it's the... All I mean, this is funny because people ask me, oh, I want to be on team human. They don't mean on the show. They want to be on the team. And like, if you're human, you're already on team human, right? You're already here. You're already one of us. But there's a whole lot of people on team human that, you know, I don't like (laughs) or I don't agree with or I'm scared of or and, and it feels like the job is to be able to look at those people, to look up and look them in the eye and actually form some forge some rapport and solidarity with those people to see if the mechanisms that we're talking about, the mirror neurons and all that, can those take, can those work? And it it, it does yield unexpectedly, I mean, not to be utilitarian, but useful, positive results. You know, when I watched you know, Trump give a speech. I watched him as the human being and I understand where this man's coming from. I really do. What it's like to live in that paranoid place where you're constantly arguing in a certain way and hope people don't discover you. I could feel it. You know, when I looked at at, at Derek Chauvin, you know, at, at even though he's wearing the mask, when I watched his eyes as the verdict was being read, I could see the trap mouse. I could see the 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 I once had a trap mouse in a in a supposedly humane mouse trap in my house and it it, it couldn't get out and I, I saw him there and, and I was like wow there's still with all there's the panic there's the panic of the human um so for me it was that and I felt like uh learning to do that even in places where I want to experience the difference because that person is doing stuff I don't agree with or I'm scared of I've got to see how that's possible in my organism too. And it feels like it's sort of part of, of, of their healing is going to be, is going to be my healing with that rather than me creating this artificial boundary and otherness of the person who's doing the shitty thing. You know, they're in the, they're in the team, right? It's the same. I remember when I was a kid, not a kid, even I was, must've been in high school when Tom Snyder, remember him? He was this, late night talk show host. And he went into the jail and interviewed Charlie Manson. And it was this big TV event. And Charlie Manson kind of ran rings around this guy logically. The guy kept, uh, uh, Tom Snyder kept asking him, are you responsible for the murders of Sharon Tate? You know, because he didn't go in there. He was, he gave the orders to whoever squeaky and those people to go do it. Um, Are you responsible? And he kept saying, well, who's responsible for me? Well, who's responsible for anything? You know, and he started to talk about, you know, uh, uh, the systemic uh, problems that led to a Charlie Manson. And he's just the unit of humanity, the, the human unit that could be blamed for having barked certain commands, but he's in a much larger system. And that it, it stayed with me, not to say that he's not responsible for what he does. There are, there, there are ways. We I do still believe in, in, in individual autonomy, but to see everyone as part of that, as part of that system, it helps. And then Tyson took it a step further for me. When I was talking to him about it, he's like, you've got to look at it, not just as find the other people, but find the others, all the other species that are talking to you and the trees and the rocks and, and, you know, don't be so, so, so human centric in it. And then you're going to really open up to what it is that we're a part of, not just, I mean, I'm, you know, white Western guy who reads books. So I see myself as just me seeing myself as part of society is a big step you know, already, but part of this even bigger thing, the, the, all of biology or all of the, 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 all life is, uh, uh, you know, is where, is where, is where he's, he's taking it. I'm trying to, to get to that place. Well, you, you also write some really good ones too. You don't just read them. Yeah. But I, I mean, that reminds me of the, the John Lennon quote where he's like, I love humanity. It's just the fucking people I can't stand, <laughs> you know? And, and so a question die, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, like Doug has just done a beautiful um, riff on intersubjectivity. And I see myself in that humanity, however, otherwise repellent. Um, can you just speak to, you know, any of, any of the insights from the Zen tradition and your own 
experience on on that because I think again back to you know phase one of the book was hey we're we're balkanized we're tribalized we're we're collapsing and fragmenting in our trauma and we're increasing divisions and with the music the shared commonality the ability for potential for batch mm-hmm. forgiveness and seeing each other and meeting each other um, any any thoughts or or insights and then I'd love to uh, touch in with Dan- with Daniel and Brian too yeah sure just just so the people that maybe don't know me um, I, I'm a, I'm a I'm a talented mediator with not a lot of training and I'm really very not very talented meditator with like years and years and years of training so I have these two mediate meditate same route you know and so basically I discovered like oh right I'm doing the same thing I mean one time I'm doing it body speech mind environment coming into coherence and other times I'm working with people and bringing all this difference into some sort of harmony but I think the there is a saying in Zen that I think is really important, and I and this has certainly been my experience in spiritual communities. It's it says the mind of Nirvana is easy to accomplish. It's the mind of the difference that's difficult to achieve. And I think um, what I hear when I when I uh, when I hear that, what I know about humans is that when we discover unity, either our collective humanity or the mystical experience or just the oxytocin sameness in someone else's eyes, that's very relaxing to who we are. And when we encounter difference, it's exciting to the nervous system. As Julie was saying, you know, we get adrenaline, uh, norepinephrine, what's the other one, cortisol. It's all so difference and excitement and excitement very quickly becomes threat. And so part of what we don't understand is that difference is actually, we have to learn how to keep difference in this very optimal space so that we can learn and grow through it, um, and that we tend not to do that. We move from some excitement into alienation and threat super fast, and we just simply don't manage difference well. We have to stay in this sweet spot, like when you're learning any skill. What do we call that? Optimal discomfort when you're learning to ski, Jamie? So I think that that's kind of what interests me is how is it we're working with difference, and how are we helping both build the unity of experience while uh, addressing the trauma, the history, the abuse, the power abuse, you know, because the culture wars a lot. Some of the, some of that discourse is about power abuse, which is very important thing for us to start to grapple with and how, not how to get rid of hierarchies and power, but how to actually become conscious in our use of power and how we use influence and resources and those kinds of things. So maybe that would just be a nice opening bid for me in terms of the collective. So. Beautiful. And, and I'm imagining that Daniel can speak into that, the notion of moving from either ors into subtler and more complex analysis. And Brian, I mean, feel free to take it wherever you want, but I'm, I'm, there's something in there as far as the, the initiatory experience, the initiatory experience of death practices, you know, like I'm no longer one or the other. So Daniel, first of all, welcome. Thank you for being able to make it both of you guys. Brian, I, know, I think you're down. Are you you're still down in Uruguay? Yes. Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, and Daniel, you and I uh, took a quick lap together this week, but feel free to speak into whatever you're most called to. But for sure, if you're not familiar with Daniel, I would say he holds the distinction in my life as being simultaneously the one who fills me with the most dread and despair most often um, and continually comes from a warm, avuncular, um, deeply loving, compassionate, humorous, playful space. So I don't know how you do it, but if you can share some of your tips and tricks, I think we'll probably have an eager crowd. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, this is really great. This is the part of the panel I've been able to witness so far. It's really great. I'm happy to be here. I was thinking in the last part when they were talking about art, <clears throat> uh, there's this E.O. Wilson quote, you probably mentioned it already, that the love of complexity without reductionism is art, the love of complexity with reductionism is science. Mm-hmm. I really like that, that quote. And uh, either of them without the other one makes a civilization that fails. Like you fail on either side of the dialectic, on every dialectic, right? And um, I was thinking about that when you were there was a mention of a kind of batch forgiveness because we don't have the time to go through every single grievance. And it brought up to mind a conversation I had with a friend the other day who had never really 
paid attention to Judaism much. And they're like, man, I went to this Jewish holiday and these people just seem to like love to just engage in their history of misery. Like what the fuck, why would anyone want to do that? And um, so I started to explain a little bit of actually why the history of the fucked up things was very important to not repeating certain things and to their cohesion. And it relates to this principle that Jamie, you and I've talked about a lot of one of the reasons that institutional decay occurs is an or civilizational decay is that a new civilization emerges out following a war or a famine or something that destroys the previous civilization usually. And the new one starts because some people figured out how to actually organize and take care of humans effectively coming out of something very difficult. And then their kids and then several generations down the way haven't had the lived experience of that revolutionary war, that very difficult thing. It's just a mythos. They don't believe it. And then they start to repeat the same mistakes that led to it previously. And so there's this question of how is it that we can develop strength and resilience that typically only comes from trauma without traumatizing ourselves? Is there a way to be able to induce the kinds of difficulty and psychological hormesis that creates strength with less trauma? Is there a way to be able to remember the things that were the basis of an effective civilization without having always gone through them? And, you know, that one of the reasons that the Jews were able to maintain as a diaspora with no homeland for so long across so many countries had to do with that collective intelligence cohesion practice. And so then you see that in terms of, say, the woke movement today and what seems like the holding on to grievances from slavery or previous periods and kind of not wanting to let go and move forward. And it's because you have forgiveness and you have justice and you have to hold those both because you can fail very easily on either side of that. And one of the things Jamie, you and I've talked about in terms of like, okay, so we have X risk from not just climate change, but a million planetary boundaries. So why have humans organized their activity in a way that has so kind of comprehensively ruined the environment? Um, and we have X risk from the application of biotech, nanotech, AI, cyber tech, n- nuclear tech, almost every powerful tech we get, we are oriented to use in ways that either directly cause harm or indirectly cause harm. Why? What is underlying that? One of the many things is systems that incentivize predatory and parasitic behavior or sociopathy, where someone can do something that is beneficial to them, fucks the whole, but they get away with it and uh, accumulate power in the process. So if we want to actually survive the exponential power that we have, one of the questions we have to figure out is how do we close the evolutionary niche for sociopathy and narcissism and basically parasitic and dysfunctional power dynamic types of human behavior? And from an evolutionary theory, every niche that has energy and it gets filled. So if there is a niche for people to fuck the hole and get away with it, they will. Some people will, even if they were conditioned well, but they got a head injury. You know, it's like some stuff happens. And yet then that becomes a strange attractor and creates the beginning of a, of a multipolar trap because they get power and can do more stuff with it. So there is a kind of transparency and accountability that is necessary to avoid creating an evolutionary niche for sociopathy. Because when people can do fucked up stuff and it doesn't get seen or there's no accountability, it ends up happening. And so that's the argument against forgiveness is to say, wait, I'll forgive when I've seen it really change, when I've seen the accounting, the reckoning actually happen. And yet, of course, sometimes there is an emotional step in the direction of forgiveness that is necessary to shift some of the dynamics, but there's a dialectic there, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the question you you were asking of, uh, and I think you asked me on the phone right before we talked about coming on here yesterday of the dialectic of being cognizant of the uh, very unique catastrophic risk situation the world finds itself in today and having a psychological orientation that both still allows us to enjoy the beauty of life and add to it and maybe do something constructive and how do you kind of hold those together? Uh, Should I say something about that? Go for it, man. And 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 I, and I want to connect. I, I want to connect your. I, I'm believing you. You were referring to kind of Yom Kippur and and the note like ritualized collective forgiveness and continuity of memory. Um, Brian, over to your deep study of exactly that over literally millennia. So so please lay down lay down the remaining plank, and then we can also pop it up into the mythopoetic, the cultural. 
Um, so you you said, and it's you know kind of jokingly about uh, being one of the people that brings up the most dread or whatever, because obviously a lot of my work is looking at the current uh, catastrophic risk landscape, and so so as to be able to do something about it, to be able to ameliorate it. Um, but it can be overwhelming because the scope of the issues is so much larger than the scope of our individual agency. And as beings, we evolved to have our sen our sensing of the world and our sense making connected to our choice making. There was a closed loop where what we were sensing and what we had agency over were connected. There was no evolutionary purpose to be aware of stuff we couldn't act on. Right now, those are very broken open and we can be aware of stuff we have no idea how to act on. And then when there's a collapse of a sense of agency, it's hard to actually keep sensing and sense making without it messing something up. So people can go into nihilism or overwhelm if they don't feel like they can do something about what they're aware of. Um, uh, the couple quick things that I would say is uh, if you read The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg, we shouldn't have made it through the Cold War in any kind of probabilistic forecast ahead of time. The computer sequence for mutually assured destruction took us into the countdown sequence just from computer glitches so many times. Um, people who were manning nuclear subs who had no radio connection and had to make the choice, like, like we just shouldn't have made it through. And then people forecasting earlier on is like, there's no way we make it to mutual assured destruction. Like it, it takes every single nuclear event not happening to not go extinct. It only takes one of them even accidentally happening to go. And somehow it didn't happen. So it's easy in a probability analysis to come up with a certain level of certainty that is actually not warranted because we're pretending that the unknown unknowns are smaller than they are. And we're exaggerating the known space to be a bigger pers perspective a uh, bigger part of reality than it is. And this is very dangerous because if we say for sure nuclear is going to kill everyone or for sure we're on the path to AGI and AGI is going to kill everyone. So we have to chip ourselves into the AGI or whatever it is. When you have excessive certainty about a really bad thing happening, then utilitarian ethics makes it justified to do other really bad things that are less bad than not doing that thing. And so there's this continual calibration of what is my Thanos actual effect. basis for certainty? What's that? I just said the Thanos effect. The Thanos effect, exactly. Um, and this is where utilitarian ethics in complex systems where you can't forecast all that well, but you still have an orientation towards wanting higher certainty becomes very dangerous. Um, so there, what, what I would say is there's a level of staying connected to the depth of the unknowable, you can call the mystery, that is required, while also having having that not decrease the intensity of your epistemic drive to come to know as much as you can to and as effectively as you can to inform progressively better decisions, but that always are making choice in the presence of uncertainty and that are utilizing the full human capacities, the, the science and art, right? The, the complexity with and without reductionism, both of which are critical because the applied science is what makes the tech that drives the existential risks you have to understand it well, but you also can't be limited to just uh, applying it. Uh, maybe this is the last thing I'll say. You were asking me about kind of optimism or pessimism in the presence of it. And I think probably a lot of people have read Teal's uh, definite optimist model. Of Just give us a one, one sentence, two sentence summary of that. Two by two matrix. You can be an optimist or a pessimist and a definite or an indefinite one. A definite pessimist knows exactly why they're on Like we're gonna we're fucked because nuclear or we're fucked because AI. They have a definite reason. Indefinite optimist is we're fucked because humans just kind of suck and something bad's gonna happen. Um, there's a, a indefiniteness. The indefinite optimist is like I believe in miracles and good things will happen. The definite optimist is I see a particular tech solution to solve this thing. So Teal's saying, I really only care about definite optimists because they're the only ones that build shit. And so, and it makes perfect sense for a venture capitalist who wants to build, you know, fundable solutions, that kind of thing. I would say it's true that the, def the definite optimist is going to be more likely to build solutions, but I would also say that they are the cause of all the X risks we face today in one meaningful way too, which is it's the solutions to narrowly defined problems that end up causing other problems by externalizing harm to something that wasn't part of that definite solution set. Mm -hmm. So I can make a solution to helping people socially connect called Facebook and externalize ruining the entire information commons and undermining democracy as an externality that I wasn't paying attention to because I had a definite focus with the reductionism. 
And so we, there is actually an argument I want to make for the relationship of all those quadrants, actually. I want to have an optimism of a felt sense of possibility, even when I don't know what it is. That's kind of an indefinite optimism. Then that has me look for definite solutions. But then I want to use my pessimism to red team my own solutions to say that why will this not work or why will it externalize harm somewhere else? But then I want my indefinite optimism to motivate me to keep looking and not just get overwhelmed and shut down. So I keep iterating, but towards solutions that are progressively better for larger definitions of what is meaningful rather than just narrow definitions. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I, and I hope, I mean, I experienced this pretty much when every panelist came on and shared from your heart, which is just the beautiful depth and power of your perspectives and, and what you guys are holding and bringing. So if any, anyone who is watching and, and listening along, um, you know, find these names, Google these people. If you're not already familiar, like go deep in their bodies of work um, because these are, these are pieces of our shared puzzle. And we don't even necessarily know what the whole picture looks like, but I would say this is an asymmetrical representation of folks with a, with, with a solid, solid guess and, and a good eye um, for creating. So with that, Daniel, so you, I, there, was, there, was a, there was a phrase you said mm, five minutes ago that has now eluded me, but it was something along the lines of how do we maintain, I mean, you ended with how do we maintain effectively what you could call radical hope? right? Which, which is that sort of um, ruthless assessment of current realities, indefinite hope or optimism for, for possibilities. We talked about how shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, you know, the conditions that create compassion, wisdom, humility, innovation get lost generationally because by that third or fifth or whatever generation, they, they grew up in happy times and didn't have the same hardening. And then we took, and you, then, and you began with this notion of collective remembrance, right? As a, as a transmitter of culture, hopefully to avoid voltage drop, right? That the old joke of like Christ made more Christians than Christ, Buddha made more Buddhists than Buddhas. Bruce Lee didn't make another Bruce Lee. So you're like, okay, that's an issue as far as exceptional transmission of culture. Um, but Brian, you know, you've been deeply, deeply studying what I think is arguably, you know, top 10 as far as long-term transmissions of culture of exactly this, of an awareness of our states and, you know, and death and hope and rebirth that persisted not even for the couple of thousand years of the Lucinian mysteries, but potentially even further, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on psychosocial technologies that kind of lead us into worship and remembrance and connection? Uh, well, first off, congrats on your book. Thanks, man. I, under I understand it's not terrible. That that's a great pull quote. Not not <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it doesn't suck. Yeah, it doesn't suck. Worth worth an hour. Um, a hello to to Julie and Matt and and others. Uh, it's good to see friendly faces here. Um, uh, I have nothing profound to say, um, but I, I will I will weigh in briefly because I have to go catch my daughters, which I feel like I say every Zoom. Um, I have to pick up uh, the daughters, but in the meantime. Uh, there, I think we had, um, we had technologies in the past, and I, I went looking for those technologies, and I focused a lot on Eleusis as kind of the spiritual capital of the ancient world. Um, and not that there's any Greek miracle, not that, you know, democracy and the arts and sciences just kind of showed up overnight in Athens, but, you know, the way that, that Athens and the rest of the Greek civilization absorbed everything that was beautiful and, and wise from North Africa and the Near East and Persia and India and elsewhere came to us through this, this incubator of the ancient Greeks. Um, and I think Eleusis was a big part of that story. Um, if you don't know what Eleusis is or was, it survives for 2000 years until it's um, wiped off the map at the end of the fourth century AD under the largely Christianized Roman empire. And I say that as a good Catholic boy, uh, because there, there, were, there were two worldviews clashing there. And, and I think what was clashing was this direct experiential encounter with the sacred, with the divine. Um, the Greeks would say with the goddesses, with Demeter and Persephone, right there. You, you went there on pilgrimage to have this, this encounter, the, this, um, what Professor Ruck would say, the culminating experience of a lifetime. 
Um, what could that possibly be? We know there's a vision involved. We know there's a magic potion involved. Are psychedelics involved? Well, I spent 12 years trying to find them and there's some pretty good data to suggest that. But at the end of the day, I don't think that really matters one way or the other. I think what matters are these rites of passage and these initiation ceremonies that were part and parcel of the birth and development of Western civilization. I like to say that there's this, there's this prophecy from the fourth century that as Eleusis is about to be rent asunder, there's this priest who says that, listen, man, um, and he's talking, I'm not, yeah, he's talking to the Roman emperor. And he says, listen, if you get rid of Eleusis, you get rid of us. And there was this, there was this concept that whatever happened there, whatever vision was witnessed by generations of initiates over 2000 years, it held not just Greek civilization together, these aren't my words, uh, but it held human civilization together. There was something about this rite of passage, which we obviously lost, um, and this, this, this mind-blowing visionary encounter that for some reason um, was seen as the hub of Greek existence, the thing that kept us together, the thing that may have promoted this concept of the human tribe and team human um, and things like kindness and resource sharing and self-sacrifice and all the things that we should aspire to. It seems like it was there and there was a technology to make that happen. Whether that was partly psychedelic or even psychedelic adjacent, um, there was there was technology there um, and, and, and we lost it. Um, and so maybe we go forward partially by, by looking back. Um, there's lots of technology available today. You write about it in great detail um, for re-encountering the numinous. Um, none of it will be news to anybody here, but uh, there's lots of interesting modalities available to us to encounter one of these, you know, heroic ego death states. Um, and I think that this, if, if I'm referring to anything in my research, by the way, when I refer to a key, I'm, I'm referring to that as the immortality key, the, um, the encountering in the here and now of a sense of eternity, not that the kingdom of heaven is that which awaits us after life, and this is good Catholic doctrine, but the kingdom that awaits us right now in the flesh, in this lifetime, this is the promise of the gospels, um, that you become immortal uh, by drinking flesh and blood, and that probably sounds vampiric and cannibalistic, but that, there's, there's another technology there which we can get into another time. But the, the idea being that to die before you die in this lifetime seems to have been part of the technology that was passed along from high civilization to high civilization could very well be prehistoric, may just even precede our species. Whoa, I hadn't heard that dog leg. <laughs> you think the Neanderthals were getting jiggy? Like, was, was that a possibility? Um, Certainly, they were they were they were ecologists, and certainly they they were they were well versed in plant technologies. Um, I mentioned just one study in my book um, from 2012. It was released. Uh, they found you know evidence of things like yarrow and chamomile, which aren't that mind altering, but at least like the 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 technology that was available to the Neanderthals 50,000 years ago has been proven by archaeochemical analysis to have been used by them for for something. Um, and it's it's possible that it goes far beyond that, as a matter of fact, that we may have co-evolved with all these allies that exist in the plant and fungal kingdom for a reason. Beautiful. So, so die before you die. And, and, and any, any just closing thoughts on death, rebirth rituals? I, I, you've just spoken most poetically about it, like the, the ubiquity of it and the centrality of it. Um, you obviously went deep into the Lucinian and then into the early Christian, but sort of what is your sense of it as a recurring cultural theme around the world. What's your, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, my, my take is that it's very difficult to prove unbroken continuities from the upper Paleolithic into the Neolithic, into the Bronze Age and the high civilizations. But, but there are rough sketches where you can trace things like death cults and ancestor worship and God worship, um, you know, right to when we become um, farmers, when we go from hunting and gathering to farming. And like I say, probably many tens of thousands of years before that, but we can trace at least back to Gobekli Tepe, 12, 13,000 years ago, we can trace death cults and ancestor cults that clearly go through, survive the Neolithic and, and touch all these high civilizations in antiquity. And I, I argue go right to the heart of, of ancient Christianity. Um, the mass today I've described as something like a communal seance. It is the place where the living interact with the dead. Um, any good Catholic boy should know that. The communion of saints is something that we talk about. Um, the ancestors are alive. Ancestors are with us. And so in a culture where we largely ignore death um, and subcontract out the latter days to, you know, 
uh, a burgeoning hospice care industry. There's, uh, there, there, there's a lesson there from antiquity about familiarizing ourselves with, with the dead and with the death and dying process. Um, and that we ourselves should seek to die in some heroic way um, before our physical death. And, and therein is, um, it's, it's a technology. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, folks. And, and yeah, I mean, if, if you haven't checked out Immortality Key, um, it is an absolute ripping read. I think it's what the Da Vinci Code wanted to be when it grew up um, and, and much, much more fun. And as you just heard from Brian, um, filled with, filled with po scholarly poetry. So um, you sandbagged starting and then delivered exactly what I knew you would. Right. So awesome. Um, so, so folks, I mean, we, we've, we've, I mean, <laughs> this was exactly what we thought it might be, which was this wonderful rollicking freight train, um, that we all just hopped on board for what has now been three hours. Um, and I just want to, and, and we've barely scratched the surface of anybody's brilliance and genius and wisdom. Um, but hopefully we have been exploring, right. These themes of, of where have we come from? And what's going on, and what do we do now? <laughs> I mean, you want to escape it really straightforwardly. Um, and I think, you know, as as so many of you have spoken to, not only are the answers in our texts, they're in our cultures, they're in our traditions, they're in our stories. Um, and that toolkit is is our birthright and potentially our jump bag. You know, it might be the very thing we need to leap into this future together. So in its own tiny little way, um, the book Recapture the Rapture is an attempt to just render that toolkit legible, credible, and accessible. Um, but it's all of the work of the folks that have been our dear guests, um, friends, and allies that are doing the real work. This is just a signpost to all the possibilities. Um, so, you know, please, A, Thank you, guys. Thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to David and Ali at Rebel Wisdom uh, for co-hosting and co-producing. Thank you to everyone who has shown up um, today, who has been a part of this conversation in these few hours, but broadly over the months and years. And um, if you feel so inspired, you know, please do like communicate this book to other people. Like I did not write this for a single um, commercial or professional reason. My wife, Julie was like, you're fucking crazy, dude. Don't write this book. And I was like, I think I have to, I think I have to. So, it, so we did. Um, but the intention is it's a toolkit and there's no singular, more meaningful um, success metric than people writing back to us, communicating with each other, stitching this together and actually doing the thing with as much joy and creativity and courage as we can muster. So that's, that's our us. That's our huge thanks. Um, and I'll just leave, leave us with um, a brief, a brief reading, just a, a paragraph. That's not the final paragraph. Cause I've been told that's a stupid thing to do. You have to read to it to get to that one, but the almost final paragraph. Radical hope gives us perspective beyond the false certainties and the certain vulnerabilities of our own lifetimes. We may not get to the promised land ourselves, but we keep on walking in the conviction that our children or their children might. The question's not having hope, as Cornell West reminds us, it's being hope. As we let go of our own potential, of our own personal references and preferences, we can reorient to the longer arc of humanity finding its way to the Omega point. That really would be the greatest Cinderella story of all time, delivered from evil at the stroke of midnight, or not at all. So much love, everybody. Um, panelists, guests, thank you so much. Um, over the moon, grateful, inspired, galvanized, all the good things. Um, Leah and Greg, when, when, the, when, the, when it's time to make a joyful sound, we will all be there. And for everybody everywhere, uh, stay awake, build stuff, and help out.
Be well, everybody. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.